RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is fun, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words for following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design. That's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. In Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-738-067 or check us out online. Dot com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Cows. This is Justice here at Block Talk Radio. If you want to learn, listen, understand, and question, go to blocktalkradio.com slash victim dash of dash racism. And for more information on racism and white supremacy, go to my blog, justdojusticetoday.blogspot.com. My email address is justice.asap at yahoo.com. Replace white supremacy with justice, ASAP. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. How people are very serious about not being very serious. I just said, are you a racist? Oh, okay. I thought there was something before that because there was about 20 seconds of silence. Um, well, you know, as I've said before on Gus's program, um, I have, as a white person growing up in this culture, internalized certain elements of racist and white supremacist thinking, no question about it. I've talked about that, written about that. Um I distinguish Excuse that. Excuse me, point. I just want yes or no. We'll see, but that's not the way human psychology works. The way I've answered the question before, and I will answer it again, whether one likes the answer or not, is that I have internalized aspects of racist thinking, as I would suggest every white person in the system of white supremacy has done. Now, that is different, however, from saying that I believe in, support, and advocate the system of racism and white supremacy, which I actually reject and attempt to fight against, but I would be dishonest if I did not acknowledge that I, like every other white person, have internalized certain aspects of racist thinking. I've always said that, but I do not believe that is the same as saying, as I think some believe it is the same as saying, that I therefore support actively and advocate for the system of racism, which is a system that I find deplorable, actually. Um, the words that you're using, I do not um, understand. Why is that? And all I and all I need is just a yes or no. Are you a racist? Yes or no? See, but that's not how human psychology works. It is not a yes or no question. What's what human, whatever you call it? Psychology. 
psychology is the way that the brain functions. It's the study of the brain. And I don't the want the brain functions or anything like that. All I want is just a yes or no. Right, but it's not a yes or no question. And so you're going to be frustrated if you ask me that question. I've answered the question in very basic English, and I'm quite certain that you do understand. But I know that we like to play games on the show sometimes. And so I'm going to suggest that this is a very simple answer. I said I have internalized aspects of racist thinking. Now, if you want to take that as a yes to your question, feel free to do it. But I've also said that I have also internalized anti-racist thoughts, anti-racist norms, anti-white supremacist thinking, because even though I was exposed to racist ideas, and those have affected me, like they've affected everyone, I was also taught to be an anti-racist, and so I've internalized that as well. So the best way that I can answer your question is to say that I have both internalized racist ideas and anti-racist ideas. Whether that makes me a racist in your estimation, you know, that's for you to decide. I'm simply saying it's part of who I am. It is not you, all you're, of you. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. Context of white supremacy. Uh, Gus T. Renegade in for another program. Uh, hopefully the goal uh, to share constructive information on racism, white supremacy, what it is, and how it works. Um, we are broadcasting all over the place today. <laughs> um, the white people at Blog Talk Radio uh, did not delete my account. Um, they did take away all my, my cool privileges, and um, I believe they have refunded uh, my money, uh, but they uh, snatched all of the, the cool artwork that I had down, and I don't have all of the lines that I once had, but uh, they didn't delete the account, so people can still access the archives, and uh, we compensated. We uh, have a brand new site set up at TalkShoe.com, so now instead of broadcasting in just one spot, we are simulcasting in both spots, so you can listen at Blog Talk Radio, you can listen at TalkShoe. Um, yeah, you know, hey, get more get more content now. You can stream the cows in multiple places. Um, so you can call in at Blog Talk. You can call in at Talk Shoe. I'll give out the numbers as we roll. Uh, Blog Talk will only be there for uh, 45 minutes. I said the white people did strip our privileges, but Talk Shoe, that is not the case. Uh, full program as usual. You can go there and listen live. You can call in. I'll make sure to give out the numbers for people uh, as we roll. That's it. want to get started with the program. Um, I try to um, really pay pay as much attention as I can to things that are happening. I try to read uh, news reports. I try to check news sites. I try to, uh, as I sit and use my Facebook and really all of uh, the social networking sites that I can as weapons uh, to gather information about how racism and white supremacy works globally. And uh, I was, I believe, checking my Facebook and someone had posted a video um, showing some sort of demonstration in Tel Aviv, Israel. And they I wasn't sure if they were white people or not, but uh, they were very clear in saying that they were not pleased with the non-white black residents uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, that they shouldn't be there, they're not supposed to be there. Um, the first video that I watched, I believe they, they referenced the area where these people resided as garbage town, um, just really, um, I, I can't really say shocking. <laughs> I mean, for anyone who listens to this program, it shouldn't be shocking, but it definitely was interesting, um, finally to be, you know, seeing live footage, uh, in Israel and it, it looking pretty much the way, uh, I see non-white people treated worldwide. At any rate, I contacted the, uh, journalist who put the film together and uh, he actually had a lot of great footage, uh, documentarian, designer. He had a lot of great footage, uh, or maybe great isn't even the right word. Just uh, he had a lot of footage that seemed to evidence the global system of white supremacy. Uh, he is also writing uh, news articles uh, for a newspaper uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, many of his reports also deal with racism, and uh, he was willing to share a bit of his time with us um, to share his views on you know, what he's observing in that area of the world. And I thought that would be really informative for our listeners. Uh, our guest joining us live uh, from Israel, uh, you can check out 
uh, some of his reports. Uh, I will make sure to link the article that he just had published today. Really interesting <laughs> report. I cannot wait to uh, share some thoughts on that as well. Uh, but our guest for the program, Mr. David Sheen. Uh, Mr. Sheen, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me, Gus? Crystal clear. Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. For sure, for sure. We're glad you could uh, glad you could join us. As I said, I'm I'm real uh, dedicated to having a global perspective in the conversation on racism, white supremacy, and uh, you first person joining us from the area of the world known as Israel. So great mm-hmm. to have you on the program. Um, Thank you. Before uh, before we hop into your work, is there anything you would like our listeners to know? You think it would be important for them to uh, know about who you are and the work that you do? Um, well, I, I guess, uh, I could just introduce myself. I, um, I was born in Toronto, Canada. That's where my English is from. And, uh, my, my father was actually born here in Israel and his parents too. And, uh, I, I immigrated to Israel, uh, in 1999. And since that time I've spent, uh, more than half the time here, I've also spent some years back in North America, but a um, majority of the time, the last uh, decade has been here. And uh, having lived somewhere else gives me the added perspective of seeing it in three dimensions, so to speak. And, and um, have you ever been to Toronto, Gus? Have you managed to get up there? <laughs> I am a victim of racism, and I have uh, meager resources. However, I have mm-hmm. been to Toronto. Okay. <laughs> um, well, it, I, I don't know what your experience of the city has been, but um, one thing that you can say about it is that uh, it's very multi-ethnic, and some people have written that uh, it's the most multicultural so-called place in or city in, in North America. So um, having that, and, and of course, there's lots of things that I can say about Toronto and, and the and the racial situation there. But at least uh, the Canadian government, and uh, specifically in Toronto, ma- makes an effort at least to to say that they promote a, a multicultural vision there, and and some of it filters down. And the the result from my experience has been that. Um, it's it's more like at least pe- people are taught now, now of course they're they're taught lots of things but at least the official line is that uh, everyone should feel comfortable there everyone should feel equal there and so the way that i was brought up at least in in that society was it's that that's that's the basis we start from um when i moved here i realized that there are a lot of there are very different norms here in Israel, I think that certainly that, that there there is a, a level of multiculturalism here simply because the government has endeavored to bring to Israel Jewish people from who have lived in so many different countries around the world. At the same time, it's endeavored to make sure that those who immigrate are are, are Jewish. So. Uh, in order to create a a Jewish majority in in the land of Israel, in the state of Israel. So because of that, there's this really weird situation where on one hand, the country is proud of its multicultural heritage and they point to it as a a positive point. They'll say, look, we have Jews from all over the world here. We've got Jews from Morocco, from North Africa. We've got Jews from Iraq. We've got Jews from Poland. We've got Jews from... Uh, Ethiopia from Russia um and and you know that is supposed to demonstrate multiculturalism and, and it does you know there are people of different ethnic groups living here but the common denominator is that they are all uh, that they can all prove matrilineal descent or conversion to orthodox Judaism essentially and uh and so I guess you could say it's multicultural, but not multi-religious. I don't know if there's a term, but the point is that there isn't the same uh, there isn't the same level of of uh, at least public pronouncements 
in favor of having a multicultural reality here. And in fact, there are many public uh, forces that strive to create a Judeo-centric or uh, uh, unicultural reality here. And, um, but I, I just wanted to just say that it, it's you know in part because I was born in Toronto that I'm able to actually see, oh, wait, this isn't normal. This isn't healthy. This isn't right. So that's just a, a little bit about where I'm coming from. And um, I write about lots of different issues. I, I write a lot about ecological issues. Uh, that's been a lot of my focus for the last several years. But I... And I intended to continue focusing on that, but in the last few years, the you know although I do participate and support um, struggles for 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 human rights here in Israel, in the last years it just sucked me in, and I've had to spend more and more of my energies uh, supporting those struggles. Uh, in this case, with journalistic work, because. Uh, it's just gotten worse and worse in the last couple of years. So uh, more and more, as, as you pointed out, of my video work and written work uh, have been about the uh, racism in this country and how that's playing out in society. And so that, that, that's a little bit of an introduction about myself. Hmm. Uh, you are a white man, is that correct? That is true. I have white skin privilege. Um, my father's family is originally from Georgia in the USSR, and uh, or former USSR, Georgia. And uh, my mother's family is from Poland. And uh, actually, it's just a little bit interesting. When my uh, father's family immigrated to Israel from Georgia, it was about 100 years ago, uh, they were racialized as black, meaning that uh, they were called black. At that, I guess the Jews that were living in the country at that time um, called them black because to them they were they were the blackest people in I guess that neighborhood or or whatever. So that was what they were called. Of course, um, if you'd see me if we were doing a video chat, you'd see that my my features are not you know that they're not. Uh, anything remotely similar to people who live in the you know sub-Saharan Africa, but I guess you know at that point that's how they were. And and later when Jews immigrated from Morocco to this country, also I mean those people from Morocco certainly there are people who are uh, you know like sub-Saharan African people who are people who have features that are um, more similar to sub-Saharan Africans who live in Morocco, but we would probably describe most Moroccans as having Arab racial features. And when those people came to Israel, those people, again, were racialized as black. Um, so that's just, it's a little bit of a different way that this culture maps uh, uh, racial identity. But uh, uh, yes, of course, I'm a white male. That's right. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, this program, uh, The Cows, uh, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, I use those two terms as synonyms, same definition for both terms. Uh, that definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists and do you think that definition is accurate? I do think that such a system exists, I do think that that definition is accurate. <laughs> wow. That is uh, quite rare to have a white person. I mean, we do have a lot of white people on the program, but mm. to have a white person just say, yes, 
system is uh, exists. Yes, system accurate and silence. Generally, <laughs> they uh, <laughs> they generally will throw in some more words. Yeah, it does exist, but you know, uh, 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 they will try to get away. It is quite rare to have someone, a white person. Mm. Yes, yes, and silence. <laughs> that is uh, <laughs> wow. Right on. Okie doke. And we're still keeping the bar up. Our guest, uh, and I will not say Mr. Sheen. I'm going to see if I can be good the whole program and say David. Okay. Uh, David requested that I not say Mr. Sheen. Just, you know. But I just said we were, we were having a phone conversation before that we went on, on uh, live on the radio. So it was just two people on the phone. It seemed silly. And please continue because uh, – but uh, that, that's why I said it. It just seemed silly, you know, when there's only two people on the phone. There's no uh, – <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want me to call you Mr. Renegade, and then we can both do it, and then uh, and everyone can do it. We can all call each other Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Okay. So uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. No, no worries. No worries. Um, but yeah, he. In addition to that, he said, you know, make sure that uh, you you call me on the program. Do not, you know, wait until I hang up. If if I say something that you think is racist or you think I'm I'm not doing the correct thing, call me on it on the program. And uh, no worries. That is, <laughs> we're all about here on the con- and and callers too. He said this. If people that are listening in, if you think you know he says something that's racist or he doesn't do the correct thing, uh, call him on it while he's here. He doesn't want to be. Uh, called out or criticized after he leaves. So the bar is up very high. Certainly we're always courteous, but definitely make sure you uh, call him. If you hear him say something that's not correct or not using the correct terms, got to make sure you call him on it during the program. He said he would appreciate that. Yeah. No, I I obviously I can't control what people say about me afterwards. You're you're welcome to, but I would prefer if people, uh, you know, that way we can have a conversation. And I'm definitely open to hearing what people have to say. And, and that goes for you, too, of course, as well, guys. So thank you. Appreciate that. No worries. No worries. All right. um, when I emailed uh, David about being uh, a guest on the program, um, when I email people that are in the States, I generally will let them know, you know, some of the guests that we've had on the program that have some name recognition um, generally, Tim Wise, people know who that is. People that I want to come on the program, they generally are affiliated with racism in some way, shape, or form, and they generally have at least heard his name before. Uh, mm-hmm. When I'm pitching for people who do not live in the States, I don't know, it, it changes things dramatically. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't assume everyone knows who Tim Wise is. Um, when I emailed uh, David, he did know who Tim Wise was. Uh, mm-hmm. And in fact, he, uh, I think, did some research on the program and saw, oh, you know, Tim Wise, you're familiar with him. You should have just said that <laughs> from uh, from the beginning. And mm-hmm. uh, I've just what, the power of Tim Wise. Um, he's been on this program uh, repeatedly. I played a, a brief snippet uh, of his second time visiting with us. That was uh, in January of last year. Um, what are what are your views? What's your opinion of uh, Mr. Tim Wise and the quote unquote anti racist work that he does? Mm. Okay, well, I, I certainly can't uh, claim to have like a uh, thorough knowledge of like his body of work. Um, I've only uh, I've read a couple articles that he's written, and I've watched uh, a video of a presentation, a speech that he gave at uh, an audience. Uh, to an audience in the United States of uh, what seemed to be um, mainly African people, African American people, black people in the audience, um, and I really appreciated uh, what he. Someone had put me onto him. Someone said, "Oh, you should check this guy out. He, he really, uh, you know, his his words about racism really need to be heard. He really explains it well." And so I'm always interested to hear about people who are, you know, truth tellers, speaking truth to power, uh, learning, trying to find videos and audio and, and text clips that are that that are better weapons for us or better tools for us to help, other, you know, explain to other people what they need to know. And um, and when I watched him, he he told this story. We told a couple of stories, but he told this one story about. I believe it was his grandmother, and I, I don't mean to bore people who maybe are already familiar with his work. I mentioned the story to you on the uh, in our phone conversation, but he told this story of his grandmother that she had been a civil rights 
advocate her whole life. She had, you know, at great personal sacrifice, she had gone and, and fought for the civil rights of African-American people and, and people of color in general in the United States. And, you know, she saw that as like a big part of her identity and she invested a lot of her resources and energy in that struggle and was regarded as such by other people. And, uh, and at the end of her life, she got uh, Alzheimer's disease in which she started to deteriorate mentally and, and forget uh, even the most basic things eventually, and, and she was hospitalized because she could no longer take care of herself. And in her in her final days, when she could no longer even recognize her own children, the, the, the people that are closest to her in her life, that you know that should be like the very last shred of of memory that you you retain. Even the, she no longer recognized her own children, but when the nurses that attended to her uh, who were African American women would approach her, she would, you know, recoil and, and use the N word to, to them, to just, you know, when speaking with them, and and I was just blown away by that. So I was struck by that, you know, by the the lesson that even someone who, uh, you know, a white person or a racialized white person who has spent, you know, the vast majority of their life fighting racism in their society um not not just among strangers but among her own family members and, and whoever she encounters would at the, when stripped from everything uh still espouse uh racist ideology or racist epithets and and uh, and what it would seem to to demonstrate is that beneath it all before you are socialized with any information in our culture, that uh, idea of white supremacy that you described earlier in the program is basically the, one of the first things that we are socialized with. One of the first, even before Gaga, Gugu, you know, Abba, Ima, Father, Mother, Mama, Papa, we're socialized with white supremacy. I was just struck at how deep that goes, you know, in our programming as babies. So once you re now I, I assume it's a true story, even if it isn't, it you know it very, you know it 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 tells the story truer than than you know truth is sometimes, uh, you know the, it 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 speaks to a truth, and uh, I thought you know if if that's the case then then obviously, uh, we are all racist because we are all born into the system that inculcates from the youngest age, uh, a belief in a hierarchy of racial superiority that you know, we are to utilize to our benefits as much as possible to navigate our, our place in the world. And uh, once, you, once you realize that, that it's inside of you, then um, I think that's a very good step because Unless you recognize it, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be in denial of it, and you can't truly combat against it. Ninety seconds. Wow. Um. You it, don't worry about that, Mr. Sheen. Uh, okay. The people that are that are dialed in at Blog Talk Radio, I see you on the line. Uh, you can hang out, but Blog Talk that feed is going to end in 15 minutes. If you would like to hear the full program, you can go to Talk Shoot, where we are also broadcasting live. Um, white people, thank you for the computer, allows great things. Um, so <laughs> if, you, uh, if you want to listen in at Talk Show, 60 seconds. There, uh, the number to call uh, is 724-444-7444. And uh, once you dial that number, all you need to do is put in the code, which is uh, just five digits, 972 Five zero, and then press uh, pound. Uh, do that, and uh, you don't have to worry about anything else. Just press one and pound, and to skip through the rest of it, and you can listen live. I'll get questions and all that good stuff. So the number again, I'll give it slow: uh, seven two four 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 seven four four four, and Ten call seconds. ID is nine. 
seven two five zero. Then press pound, and uh, just to skip through all the rest of the garbly goo, uh, press one, and then pound, and you'll be good. Uh, the free HD line is open as well. I'll give that number later, but free HD line is also open if you want to dial in there if you have the number written down. At any rate, um, I started with Tim Wise because uh, as I, he's been here so many times and so many people are familiar uh, with his material. Um, and just, you know, I think uh, Mr. Wise has become important uh, in the uh, in the legacy of the context of white supremacy. Uh, I think the I've, I've heard Tim Wise speak in person. I've seen his videos. He's been on the program, and I've I've seen him in person. In person, um, the story that I think is the bookend to the anecdote that you gave, uh, and I think this, you know, if the people who heard Tim Wise came away with this understanding, things would be fantastic. The story that I heard him tell was about his six-year-old, so keep that in mind. The story you told was about uh, a senile grandmother. My mm. story is about, or this story is about uh, his six-year-old child. And they okay. saw, I think they were watching television, and uh, I don't remember the film, but something about the film involved God, and I believe Morgan Freeman was playing God, and his white six-year-old child said, you know, that is incorrect. God cannot be a black person. Mm. He's at six, his child, bang, is already putting the pieces together for what racism, white supremacy means, uh, what that means if you're a black person, what that means if you're a white person. She's already putting the pieces together in a big way. And I mean, that's huge. Right? Like, <laughs> that, that, that is the bookend, that's for sure. And, and if the non-white people who heard Tim Wise got the whole book, hey, white people from cradle to grave, mm. racism, white supremacy is a core fundamental aspect of what it means to be a white person, every white person. It is inside of us. Sorry about that. doesn't matter if you don't like it, if you'd like to work against it. That is what it means to be a white person under this system. If non-white people who heard him got that and understood that, and even me, even Tim Y, even while I'm doing this work, I, it's in me too. I could, I could very well end up being my grandmother. <laughs> it's, uh, it could happen. Exactly. I do not see that happen at all. I see the exact opposite where non-white people see him and think there's no way possible Tim Wise could be racist. I've seen, in fact, I've seen non-white people cry in his presence, and I know, I know they were not crying and thinking, oh, my gosh, he's racist. Oh, it was, oh, I have such respect and admiration for the work you do. And to me, that just shouldn't be happening. That, to me, totally destroys uh, any, any even <laughs> constructive value that I could give. Uh, to his work, and it makes it even worse because I suspect, or it's not even I suspect, he is aware of this. I've asked him about this on the program, and I've suggested ways of remedying this, and he has not been receptive at all. In fact, mm -hmm. we can give a demonstration right now just to show you the difference. Uh, I, okay. Because I asked you this question, so I won't be asking you anything new, you, and you already answered this question, so this will be easy, should be super easy. Uh, David Sheen, are you yes. a racist? Yes, I am also a racist. Is that is that a good enough answer? Oh, you want me to say yes, I am a racist. <laughs> I mean, I just want you to tell the truth. I mean, we're just right. all about the truth. Whatever you Well, I I I I think I I just explained it, you know. I think that all white people are also racist. Um and or, I think you said it best when you said that or uh, on your website, I think I read that you'd written that all white people are suspected racists, you know, and that if you're taught it from cradle to grave, you can't not be. So, yeah. And um, so, yeah, I can you can say it, you know, I can say it. I am a racist and I am. Uh, doing what I can in my own life, in my own personal life and in my own political life to combat to, or I should say in my own personal life to combat that in myself as much as I can. And also in my political life to combat that in the world around me. But yes, I'm a racist. 
Mm. My wife is laughing at me. His wife in the background. <laughs> My wife is laughing at me in the background. But it's true. It's true, babe. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um. Hmm. Mm. Okay. I, you all have. Wait, you're, now you've got to respond. Got to I, I, you I'm coming. Come and say, I, I, uh-huh. I'm, I'm coming. I just I wanted to pause. I have a great respect for silence and just allowing things to sink in. That was very important. Very important. Uh, great decision. And we still have his articles to discuss. That was a great decision, I think, to start with Tim Wise. Um, my response is, uh, listeners, you now have a phenomenal means of judging. Mr. Tim Wise, excuse me, Timothy Wise, Justice would correct me. Uh, Timothy Wise, I played that sound clip. Justice, my co-host, who at the time was just 10 years old, but she asked Timothy Wise the same question that I asked you, are you a racist? And he ate up about 10 minutes talking about uh, human psychology and all this other stuff, he could have easily given the response that you just gave, easily. I mean, we both cited his work to give the response, so surely he could have, he knows this. That's what I mean. That's why I said I'm very uh, suspicious of him, like maximum suspicion of Timothy Wise, because he could have said what you just said. He's been studying this for years. He's written books on this. He didn't say that to a 10-year-old. To a 10-year-old, he's talking about human psychology and I'm an anti-racist and all this other stuff. He could have easily said what you just said. Uh, And he even admitted this when he came back on the following program. He admitted, I did not handle that correctly. I could have done a much better job uh, in responding to her question, answering her question. I did not do the correct thing at all. And I let him know. I suspect it was because you were consciously practicing racism. Um, I just wanted that out for the record, um, and we can we have a lot of material to cover to uh, to get to. But I, I'm I'm great. I think that is fantastic. I, any non-white person out there, uh, I think if you share the first 40 minutes of this program with other non-white people, I think it would be very constructive for them to hear Tim Wise, his response to the question, "Are you a racist?" and then to hear Mr. David Sheen, his response to are you a racist? I think that would be very constructive. Uh, man, right on. Um, wow. Okay. Although if, I did, ha- I did have the advantage of hearing his uh, track before. That uh, you know, I spoke when we started at seven at seven p.m. seven p.m. my time. I guess it's nine a.m. your time. I did have the advantage of hearing him, and I did have the advantage of reading the website. So I already like had read the critique of. This guy blathers on and on, but I didn't realize that he was talking to a ten-year-old. Oh my gosh! It, you know, like, I, I wow, that is a lot of words. Come on, guy. But um, but it, you're right. He, he's certainly someone who deals with racism. I, I'm not trying to diss on him, but uh, you know, I, I, all I'm saying is I can imagine someone who hasn't given this an, enough thought, being flustered and finding it difficult to come up with uh, how to say what I said straight. Because you got to combat your own sense of Cells. Like it's really difficult for people to 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 say that about themselves. I imagine. I imagine that it's difficult. You know, it's like look, looking yourself in the mirror and saying something negative about yourself. So I imagine that it's difficult. But someone that has given so much thought to this stuff uh, certainly, I think, n- needs to have thought of how to say it in fewer words. I would agree because it, it's uh, like you said. You know, we need to have this conversation with people all kinds of people, people for whom English isn't their first language, people for whom they've only been speaking the language for 10 years because they're 10 years old. You know, we need to be able to say, uh, I think Malcolm said, just say it plain, you know? (sighs) Yeah, context of white supremacy. And again, you know, Tim Wise, uh, he did ultimately, finally, two programs later and buckets and buckets of words later, he did say, yes, he is a racist. So I suspect he could have been consciously practicing deliberately practicing racism uh, and being very convoluted uh, in responding to a 10 year old um, at any rate um, mis- excuse me David Sheen <laughs> um, you uh, have done all these videos which we're going to get to you've done in fact 
we're going to go an easy route. We're going to we're going to okay. pitch out. Uh, this is a film. I love doing films and such. Uh, Strangers No More. I hope I want to play the first 40 seconds of the trailer and then get to some of the footage that you did around this movie that won an Oscar. Okay. Very important film. Won an o- mm-hmm. Anything that gets one of those statues, you should uh, kind of at least give a quick eyeball to to see what that's mm-hmm. about. Um, mm-hmm. But this film, Strangers No More, it won Academy Award for Best Short Film. Um, this is the trailer. Uh, for the film, it's like 40 seconds. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear it clean, and then we'll get uh, David's David's thoughts about uh, how this is relevant to white supremacy in the area of the world known as Israel. This is uh, Strangers No More. Many things make this school different. There's no other school like this in Israel. A school that has students from 48 different countries. Christians, Muslims, and Jewish together, and it is a public school from K to 12. We are a school that really opens our arms to every student, no matter where they come from, what their background is, children is the children, and in education there's no strangers. Mm context of white supremacy. Uh, Just to give a little more background, this is uh, a school, uh, this short film is uh, about a school uh, in Tel Aviv, or is it Tel Aviv or just a different? It is. Okay. It is. Uh, In the city of Tel Aviv in Israel, um, they have non-white children there, white children, and this film is kind of celebrating uh, "Quote unquote diversity." You know, we're we're not strangers anymore. We're coming together in education. It's wonderful. Look at all these children just you know having a great time. And you know what a wonderful example this is uh, of you know people getting along and doing the correct thing. And uh, Mr. Sheen, he has uh, videos and is is kind of paying attention to this and saying, "Wait a minute, something is uh, something is incorrect about all this." Can you kind of take it from there? Sure. Um, so. The, that film, and I, I should preface this by saying that I haven't actually seen the film itself, but I, you know I'm familiar with the circumstances surrounding it. It's a school that's in South Tel Aviv, and South Tel Aviv, uh, like a lot of cities, you know, they're economically, you know, um, you know certain parts of the city uh, have constituents or citizens that are that are uh, lower on the economic scale. Some are rich, or some are poor. Uh, the way it goes in Tel Aviv is that the, the richer homes are generally in the north end of the city, and then as you go further south, it's the poorer section of the city. So South Tel Aviv is a poor section of the city, and because of that, uh, rents are cheaper, and so poor people who move to Tel Aviv often migrate to the south part of the city. In the last 10 years or so, um, there's been increased migration to Israel and therefore to Tel Aviv of people um, from sub-Saharan Africa and mainly from Sudan, Eritrea, and other countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, and and others. And most of those people have come to, I I guess, you know, some of the people on the program may be familiar with the fact that... um, there's been a, there's been a war that's gone on in South South Sudan. Uh, it just voted for its independence after you know like years and years of civil war, and there's been you know flare-ups where you know hundreds of thousands of people have died and millions left homeless and refugees spilling into all the countries are surrounding Sudan. And some of those refugees, uh, try, you know, escaping violence, fleeing violence have fleed north. Uh, the country just to the north of Sudan is Egypt. And in Egypt, uh, some of them stayed and some of them have moved on to Israel, uh, who, which is the next country to the north from Egypt. So in the last several years, you've had uh, gradual migration of people across the border, it's been an illegal migration in the sense that um, because the border between Egypt and Israel uh, is a a long border and it's not, uh, there's no fence, essentially. It's something that can easily be crossed. 
um, without having to go through security checks. You just have to basically uh, pay uh, or, or just walk yourselves or uh, pay a smuggler to help you across the border with relative Thank you for ease. Using- oh, you still with me? Am I still with you, I should say? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're good. Okay, Sorry, okay sir. No, no, no problem. No problem. So um, you, you, you've had um, in the last several years tens of thousands, let's say between 30 and 40,000 approximately um, refugees from sub-Saharan Africa crossing the border in the desert between Egypt into Israel. Again, not going through uh, official channels of, you know, coming up to an army post or to a, a border control, but just crossing the desert. And sometimes they just make it through into Israel. Sometimes they're eventually, as they, because um, the Israeli army patrols the border, it, can't, it, it doesn't have a physical barrier across the border because that would uh, be very expensive or, and that's why it hasn't built one until now. But what it does is it has a, a temporal border. It, you know, it, it has a, a, a physical point that, that patrols the border. It has army jeeps that patrol the border. And so maybe you can cross the border, but then eventually, you know, a few minutes after you cross, you will be found by an army patrol. If you, if one of these uh, groups of refugees successfully crosses, they will be found by the army and the army is, um, there have been various different responses by the Israeli army, but um, over the last few years, uh, in many cases, once they've uh, these refugees or asylum seekers have crossed the borders, the army has, um, let, let's say sometimes they return them to Egypt. They say, sorry, you're not welcome here. You don't have uh, permission to enter the country. We're sending you right back to Egypt. And they they push them back over the border. Sometimes uh, at, at the at the beginning of the wave, which again was started about five years ago or so, they would arrest them and take them to jail. And they would languish in jail because no one knew about them. It's not that they had families here waiting for them or pe- human rights advocates who even knew of their existence at first. So the, people were just sitting in jail for a while. And uh, eventually, um, the courts noticed this and started to respond to it. And so some of them started to be um, just brought, to kind of bust into the the closest town. And so people would just be kind of dropped off in the middle of town. So that's how the wave began about five years ago. And since then, um, it's been a steady, steady stream of refugees, like I said, approximately 40, 30, 40,000 people. And because mm, the way that the Israeli economy works is that most of the jobs are in Tel Aviv, are in the big cities, and Tel Aviv is the biggest city in the country, in the center of the country. So a lot of people have migrated to Tel Aviv. And once they reach Tel Aviv, and they need housing, they usually migrate to the south of the city where rent is cheaper and where there are already other previous waves of African immigrants who are who have uh, who who speak in some cases the same languages as them, who have established, you know, networks there. And so then they tap into those networks. So the, that's that's the backdrop of, of why you have an increase in African population in the south of the city. Now, um, I'll just kind of give a little bit more context. Because the the south of the city... No, let's just go into what what you've described, the movie. So, okay, that movie, again, I haven't seen it, but the the movie talks about, you know, in this school, um, there's people from all kinds of ethnic groups, from all kinds of languages, all kinds of... uh, racial groups, all kinds of religions, and they're all sitting together. Why can't we all get along? Isn't this beautiful? The rainbow, you know? And of, of course, you know, I'm, I'm happy when, <laughs> when people get along. But what I was very upset about when I read uh, articles that were written in the wake of the Oscar award that was granted to that movie for best short documentary at the most recent Oscars this year, a couple months ago, I was really upset because when the filmmaker 
was asked, you know, um, why did you not even deal with the fact that these people are under threat of deportation? Because the ver- what, what, the video that you're referring to that I that I recorded and edited and uploaded uh, details that like the very next day after that author or friend, um, oh, recorded live. Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. No problem. <laughs> It's got to happen. That's cool. Um, it just reminds me that you're still there. And I'm not talking to myself. So in any case, yeah. So the very next day after this award was given, um, the g- government announced that it was that it had built a jail for to to ease or to f- further facilitate the deportation of some of the very people featured in that film, some of the very children of uh, of uh, of parents who had come into the country illegally, so to speak, and 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 had uh, and and got, enrolled their children in this school. Um, so the, they're under threat of deportation. The government is carrying out a policy of sending them out of the country, um, and the filmmakers don't even open that up. Like I was. It, it made me very upset. And I read an interview in which one of the filmmakers kind of responded to that question. And what, well, at least in that interview, what was said or that article quoted the filmmaker as saying that, well, we had a, a like a distribution deal where we were going to be broadcast in the United States on a certain channel or certain network on a certain date. And if we would have opened up that question and had to deal with it, then we wouldn't have been able to uh, produce the program by that date in order to, you know, to broadcast on that date. And to me, um, that just goes to show how this sick, sick capitalist system subverts even what you know, liberals and reformists point to as examples of how um, people can, how how supposedly the system can correct itself, how supposedly um, people have the ability to use the tools at their disposal in in a quote-unquote democracy, you know, the the media, to, um, to alert us to, to issues that are problematic so that then the people have the ability to uh, influence their politicians to to correct those problems. I mean, the, I, sorry, let, let me just interrupt myself a second. Gus, uh, do you have like a, a swearing policy? Can I use swear words or do you prefer that I don't? I'm just trying to express uh, my anger here. and I, I'm, I, I, can, I can try to be creative and use different words besides, you know, four-letter ones. But We try to stay G-rated, uh, okay. you know. Yeah, we try if, to if, if, if it slips out, it slips out. But try to okay. Well, it, it I'll, I'll I'll try to err on the side of caution. It made me very upset because here the the filmmakers gave themselves the task of telling the story of these children, and part of their story is the fact that the government is trying to deport them, specifically because you know for because of who they are, you know. It's saying that they don't have the right to be here, you know that they although they are refugees and they have escaped you know horrible circumstances because uh I can tell you from a personal experience and from conversations with other people, it's not an easy thing to leave your family behind. It's not an easy thing to leave behind the context in which you brought up and in which you have some semblance of agency and to migrate to another place where like you don't have a network and you don't have economic prospects necessarily. Um, so people who've, who've made that move and then for the government to say, we don't want you here, you're undesirable. And the filmmakers to not even deal with that, you know, shows how you know, on, on one hand to me that um, we cannot look to the system to self-correct. You know, and we cannot look to uh, uh, political liberals to uh, to create radical change and meaningful fundamental change in the societies that we live in, because they 
you know, ab- absolve themselves of responsibility of, of telling that story. In fact, they've obfuscated it. You know, they've told the story of these children. They've, they, they made a media splash. They got an award. You know, they, they got some media spotlight on them. Great. But then they told the story in a way that is going to allow um, white people, Jewish people, Israeli people to say, ah, oh, aren't we great? We allow all people to come into the country and study together, even people who suffered hardships in their own home countries and deepest, darkest Africa where there is violence and war torn. And, you know, and we, the great Israeli nation, have, you know, deemed, have, have been so generous to them as to provide them with an education. Ah, uh, go to commercial. You know, um, th- that 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 is essentially, uh, in a soundbite, what the filmmakers did, which is just the opposite of what needs to be done. Which is, yes, um, it is great that this one school in Tel Aviv has been brave and and has uh, created a space where children of refugees and migrants have um, feel equal to native-born Israelis and get a proper education, an equal education. But that that is the exception. It's not, it's not the rule. It's the exception that proves the rule. It's like that's the, the, the far, if, you, if you try to uh, extrapolate that to the rest of Israeli society, it's the farthest thing from the truth. It's just the opposite. And, and I really resent that, that that's the, the story that's being told. You know, it's good that people are, get, are you know, looking at that school. And incidentally, I pass the school every day on the way to work. You know, it's uh, not far from my house. It's between where I live and, and my place of work. So I, I, I pass it every day. And, and um, you know, I, <laughs> I just think that it's really disingenuous. It's, it's sad that the filmmakers chose the easy way out, the quick buck, and, uh, and, and perhaps even to obfuscate the true story because they knew that there's more money in telling a feel-good story about how how gr- you know the how great this this school is and not how screwed up the rest of the system is hmm. context of white supremacy um my uh, co-host justice is here uh, i think she has some questions uh, i did want to point out um i think terms are very important being being as accurate as possible uh with terms and uh, I definitely think uh, this film uh, definitely represents refinement. I wouldn't say it's the system of capitalism, though. Uh, mm. Not saying that such a system does or does not exist, but just saying that if we have agreement that there is a system of white supremacy, then the white supremacists, white people, would mm. be in control of you know whatever systems we have, capitalism or anything else. White people are in charge of that, and uh, I think it's white supremacy is the problem uh that's what i've concluded that is the the greatest problem on the planet and i think a film like this i mean this is this is white people at their best to put out a film that is supposed to show hey we're against racism this is great and the non-white children are in danger of being deported like you know the very next day i mean that man 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 and and again this is worldwide i mean i i know people in the states whether it's crash people in the uk uh this is england uh i mean they got a whole lot of different packages for how this looks um to show you something that makes it look like no 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 we're not racist when in fact yes yes we are i mean tim wise tim wise um (laughs) at any rate (laughs) Um, wouldn't be quite as funny if you were a non-white person. Um, mm-hmm. Justice, if uh, you have some questions, it's 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 so it's so sad that all you can do is cry or scream, you know, or laugh at the absolute absurdity of it all, you know, and then and then and then and then cry seconds later. That's all you can do. Yeah. <sighs> I, I hope that is not all you can do. I hope you, we can solve this problem. Uh, well, we can take a baseball bat and smash too, and you know, like we should have conversations about how we take metaphorical baseball bats or whatever other kind of baseball bats you you imagine, and to the system of uh, white supremacy and to the system of capitalism. I, again, 
uh, we don't have to go in. It's not necessarily about me, but I, you know, I do believe that. Um, certainly, I would agree with your earlier assertion just now that um, white people do uh, control the capitalist system. The capitalist system is an economic system that uh, that enables or further facilitates um, the sapping of wealth from people from from poor people to rich people or you know making poor people poor poor, poor people poor sorry and, and rich people richer and certainly the people who control that system uh, and who, who benefit the most from it are white people so it's uh, it's not to contradict that you know that the white supremacist system is is uh, the controlling system it's just saying that's like the the maybe the ideological aspect of it in capitalism is the economic hand of it mm-hmm. okay okay Groovin, uh, Justice, if you have some questions for uh, Mr. David Sheen, your line is – well, wait a minute. Let me make sure. Uh, okay. Yes. Got it. Everything is clicking. Uh, your line is open. Uh, can't even say 11 anymore. Now she is 12. Uh, mm. Justice, go right ahead. Can hey, I hear Yes, ma'am. Hey. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, how do you practice racism, white supremacy every day? Wow. Um, okay. Let me, I would say, uh, my, my straight answer to that is that if I did not do every single thing I could do to dismantle the system of white supremacy, then I'm upholding it. So every time I just go to work, you know, and do my job, um, and not, uh, you know, act against, cre- create another system, you know, and work to actively dismantle the system and just think, oh, I'm too tired today. Oh, I need to think of my own needs today. Then I'm actively aiding and abetting the system of racism because I'm, you know, I'm benefiting myself, but I'm not trying to create a world in which white supremacy doesn't exist. Is that a good answer or is that a satisfactory answer? Or do you want specific? Would you like to hear like specific things that I do? Um, um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah. What? Which? Sorry. Which? The, the second thing I said. Specific things that I do. Yeah. Um. Okay. L- let's say at work. Okay. Um. I remember. Uh, hmm, and now I'm talking about my workplace. So he, here's a perfect example. Okay, let's say uh, I experience racism at my workplace. Okay, so if I say something about it, then I am uh, standing up to the system of white supremacy and combating the system of white supremacy. If, uh, of course, at the same time, I risk um, having people at my workplace look at me negatively for doing so and therefore uh, sour relationships with my coworkers, which could, you know, potentially uh, backfire against me if I want to have, uh, get a promotion, you know? So um, of course the right thing to do is every time there's a manifestation of racism to say, Hey, that's not cool. And this is why it's not cool because it's racist. Um, If I, when I don't do that, when I don't say anything and just let it slide, that's the way that I enable racism. And so I don't, I mean, I don't want to go into too many details. I remember like my second or third day on the job, there was like an extreme case of racism that I, I just said, I don't, I don't care. You know, I'm going to say something and if I get fired, I get fired, but like, there's no way I'm just going to let it slide, you know, but there's, and there's, you know, there's days that I do say something. And then there's days where I'm just like, uh, uh, there's just I, I can't do this all the time. I, I don't. I can't change everyone. I don't have the energy to do this today. I'm just just gonna focus on my job and just do it. So on those days when I aren't always on point and aren't always combating racism, for example, in my workplace, that's an example how I uh, enable the system of white supremacy. How have you? <clears throat> How have you mistreated non-white people directly and or indirectly? 
How have I mistreated white people directly? Not or white people. No, yeah, non white people. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, Justice. I can't. Um, can can you give me an example of mistreatment? Can you give me an example of like examples of mistreatment that you encounter in your life or you observe in your life that, and then I can tell you if I've, uh, you know, uh, perpetrated some of those acts. No. <clears throat> no. Yeah. Well, I I think that. Uh, like it would, it would, I would appreciate it if you could just be a little bit more specific when you say maltreatment, because uh, it, it would help me better respond to your question. Um, I think uh, you should. There's like tons of mistreatment that non-white people get. I think you, I, I think you do know that you know non-white people do get mistreated. So you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna help you. I'm not gonna help you answer that question. Not all people do get mistreated. Um, I I try in my everyday actions to be friendly to friendly people and unfriendly to unfriendly people. Um, and so that's on an individual personal basis. You know, I would say that my actions to support the system of white supremacy are mainly in um, not opposing the system of white supremacy. I'm not, oppo- I'm not opposed to, like, I'm not above saying that there are examples. I'm just not, they don't come to mind immediately. And that's why I asked you to jog my memory, perhaps. But I try to treat all people uh, as, as I'm treated by them. Um, and so... I, I can't think of any examples of specifically ways that I um, personally mistreat uh, people of color on the basis of there being people of color at this very moment. Do you want to um, comment, Gus? Do you have like examples of, that you can think of, or also you'd prefer not to go into that? Uh, I um, generally just let her, you know. Okay, her okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, I'm just. We can go into conversation, but that's fine, Justice. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not being um, more specific. I just, I can't think off the top of my head of examples of what you're describing. Of maltreatment. You said non-treatment. M- maltreatment or poor treatment. I um I said mistreatment. Um, um, okay, mistreatment. What makes you a racist? Um, what makes me a racist? Uh, I I think based on uh, a, a racist, I would say that I, what makes me a racist is the fact that I sometimes act uh, I use the privilege that I have as a light-skinned person in the society that I live to have to have benefits that I'm accorded specifically at least in part because I'm a light-skinned person and I don't and I don't always object to the fact that dark-skinned people around me uh, are not accorded privileges are, in fact, the opposite. I'll give you an example. I thought of an example of how this occurs, Justice. Uh, in conversation with you, it's come up. Recently, I had to go to a government office to get some documents uh, processed by the government office. Now, when I went to the government office, uh, there was a long lineup. I got there before the office was open. And there were two lineups at the office. There was one lineup basically for white people and one lineup for black people. Now, there may have been a, a couple black people in the white people lineup, and but they were, they were Jewish black people. And so the, the lineup of 
white people for all intents and purposes was, let's say, a couple dozen people, and the lineup for black people was several hundred people. You know, and I didn't at that time. I used my white privilege to just say, okay, I'm going to go in the white person lineup, and I'm not going to go up to the person who organizes the lineups and say, this is complete garbage. This is ridiculous. This is racism. This is white supremacy. There's no reason why you have to have two lineups. You know, every person should be in the same lineup and should be treated by, you know, given uh, and uh, or uh, given difference you know, based on how early they got to the lineup. And uh, I didn't. Um, On that day, I just said, okay, well, I'm going to get quicker. I mean, I I kind of accepted the rationale of the person making the lineups, which is these people who are black people, um, they have a, their, their status is different because they're asylum seekers. They have different uh, needs or different requests of the government office. So therefore, if they go, they're going in a separate lineup because the the, the treatment they're going to get is going to be different. They need to talk to a different government official or whatever, and the other people need different documents. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's that's garbage. You know, they all should have been in the same lineup, first come, first serve. And I didn't question. I didn't go up to the person and say, "This is garbage. You have to change this. You have to change this now." I, I'm not saying that even if I would have said that, he would have done anything about it. Um, besides maybe, you know, arrest me for if I made enough of a ruckus or, um, you know, just said, you're not welcome here today. You're not going to get service. I I don't know. Maybe he would have said nothing. He would have said whatever, whatever, and just dismissed me. But on that day, you know, I didn't do something. So I allowed the maltreatment or the mistreatment, I think is the word that you used specifically, of the black people that day to continue by me just accepting a system of white supremacy that would grant me the privilege of getting on my way quicker. And that's my answer to just how, how do white people keep information from non-white people and why? Mm. How do pe- white people keep information from non-white people and why? I don't, I can't think of how to answer you just now. I think that certainly there is what in group conversation and out group conversation. I think there's things that people say when they're among only light skinned people that they don't say, you know, like for example, white people who will never use the N-word in front of non-white people, but they will use it um, when there's no non-white people there. Um, Certainly, I've witnessed that. Uh, In terms of how they keep other information, um, do you have any... uh, Like, Can you be a little bit more specific in terms of what kind of information you're referring to? Um, any information. Yeah. Well, I, I guess you're asking me, uh, my, my personal, uh, I try on an individual level not to withhold information as much as possible. I, in general, just as my policy in life, because if you withhold information from people, it means you, you got to remember who you told what to, and that's just too complicated for me. I prefer to just uh, tell the truth and not have to remember who I told what to. So I I generally try to to, to say what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, um, and I can't really say what is in people's minds or what is in people's hearts because I can't really read what they're thinking. Um, but of course it occurs. Um, I'm trying to think of concrete examples. Um, I can't really think of examples off the top of my head, Justice. Sorry. Why Except for just, 
<clears throat> except for except for just having conversations when black people are not there and then um I think that maybe perhaps I'm just I'm just thinking now perhaps just being blatant about people's assumptions of white supremacy uh, only being blatant about those assumptions when non-white people are not present you know because having that knowledge can then be used to point to a system of white supremacy and then once that conversation is open that system of white supremacy can be attacked uh, and broken down. So therefore, perhaps uh, white people in in general uh, prefer not to have conversations that acknowledge the existence of the white supremacist system in the presence of non-white people so that that system can't be exposed to attack. And maybe that's uh, what's underlying the resistance to using the n-word or just discussing their white people's racism when uh, non-white people are there i think i think maybe that's a i still there hello let's see uh mr gaston uh can i be heard Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Sheen, David, are you with us? Hmm. I will message him on Skype. <laughs> That's rather interesting. If uh, if uh, if we got tech difficulties at that point, because I thought that was. Uh, Quite interesting <laughs> what uh, his response to Justice's question. Uh, hmm. He's not. Uh, he's not responding in the chat. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna try. I'm going to attempt to dial him right back. I'm gonna disconnect his line and dial him back and see if that works. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir, loud and clear. Okay. Um, I, how? When did I cut off? I'm sorry, I didn't. I mean, if you want to take it from that, I don't recall exactly what point I got cut off, so I'm not sure what you heard or what you didn't hear. But uh, Justice, did you did you did he answer your question fully, or did you did he have more to share? Um. The um no. Uh, well. He answered some of it, but like he, like he, he stopped that at all, and then he was going on, but he got cut off. Okay, I, I just meant to say that I think that any time that um, white people do not uh, like that wait till they are only amongst themselves, people of white skin privilege, to discuss the the system of white supremacy and not discuss it openly, including their own racist sentiments, that is withholding information from black people because once they acknowledge their own white supremacy and their own racism publicly, then that system can be attacked and be broken down. But as long as they wait until non-white people are not present or or are in the minority or in the extreme minority to have that discussion, right? Because if there's maybe one or two non-white people, then it's very unlikely that those non-white people will take that opportunity to uh, launch an attack on the the sentiments being discussed you know, on the on the on the racist conversation, but as long as um, white people wait until they're alone or almost alone to have conversations about white supremacy and their own racism, that's a way that white people um, you withhold information from black people or non-white people that uh, harms them and perpetuates white supremacy. If I got cut off, I think that's the last thing I said. Yeah, I think that was the last thing that you said. Okay, great. Um, why do the <clears throat> why do the white people in Israel say illegals instead of non-white? And do you say illegals or non-white? Okay, um, it's an interesting situation. Um, in Israel, there is a large group of people 
that are are black people. They're from Africa, and they are they have citizenship. They have uh, Israeli citizenship, and these people are Jewish people from Ethiopia. And uh, in the 1980s, the government of Israel spent uh, money and uh, sent their military to Ethiopia and to sub-Saharan Africa to organize an airlift of people, of these Ethiopian, these Jewish people, Jewish black people in Ethiopia to Israel. It, it facilitated like a huge migration of tens of thousands of people within just a few days. Um, at that time, the Jewish people in Ethiopia had been living in Ethiopia for at least um, hundreds of years, perhaps thousands of years, according to biblical legend, according to the biblical stories, the Jewish people of Ethiopia have lived there for about 3,000 years. So um, in the 1980s, like I said, the government of Israel sent, you know, conducted a military operation to airlift these Jewish, black Jewish people to the state of Israel. Since that time, they have been citizens of the country. So when, that, I, that's, that's part of what's going on. Now, when they say Ill- illegals, what they mean is that the, the black people that they are referring to in the video are, like I mentioned, I don't know if you were listening to the program a little bit earlier before you came on, but um, in the last five years or so, a lot of African people, not, not really from Ethiopia, but other uh, countries in East Africa, like Sudan and Eritrea, uh, people, black people from those countries have been coming to Israel, and they've been coming not to the border crossings, but they've been coming and just crossing the border secretly. And when they cross the border, um, the government, uh, if I understand correctly, international law, as uh, the UN, United Nations has mandated, and uh, to whom I- Israel has agreed to uh, abide by the laws of, um, Israel is required to treat those people, even if they cross into the country quote unquote illegally, not at a border crossing. But it because these people when they cross the border, um, they claim to be refugees, meaning that they have left their own homes, their own home countries under duress because of the threat of force. Um, so in in those cases, when they claim that, now of course that's like an official legal status to say that you're a refugee. It means that the the United Nations has decided that, yes, you are in fact a refugee. And once you have that legal status of refugee, it means that whatever country you're living in, the government has to provide services for you because the government, uh, the, the, the country that you were born into is hostile to you. So whatever country you have escaped to has to provide services for you because you're a refugee. So if you've, can already, if you've already been to a United Nations office and you've proven to them that you are a refugee, you've talked to a caseworker and they've agreed to, to stamp your documents, then, then you, are, you have the documents to prove it and whatever country you're in has to treat you that way and give you services like education, health, right to work, etc. Um, but, you know, obviously that's a... Uh, to get refugee status, official status by United Nations is a bureaucratic process. So some of the people who have entered the country, uh, especially if, if they're fleeing for their lives, they haven't, they don't have documents with them to prove what they say is that they've been, you know, um, that they're under threat of their lives in the countries that they came from. So, but according to these United Nations rules, if a person claims to be a refugee, the refugee claimant, or if uh, I guess the term is called asylum seeker, they're seeking asylum, they're seeking to prove that they are in fact refugees, then the government is obligated to treat them as potential refugees. The, the government of Israel and all governments that, are, that signed this 
international law treaty are obliged to treat the people as potential refugees and allow them to enter the country and proceed to file their refugee claim with the United Nations office in Israel. So when the people that you saw in the video say, we are against the illegals, we're not against black people, they may have said even, maybe someone said, I'm not against black people, I'm against illegals. Um, what they're saying is, I'm not against a person because of the color of their skin, I'm against people who come into the country illegally. Now, again, people can, if someone is coming into the country claiming to be a refugee, then by law, you can say that, you know, they have the right to do that. Um, the, you know, the the other side, the flip side is they can also say that they came into the country illegally. It's like a, I guess you could say it's a gray area. And that's, that's why they were referring to those um, black people as illegals. I think that answers your question. How, yeah. Go ahead. How do you, how do you feel about that the white people are trying to push the black people out of Israel, and why are they doing that? Mm. Okay. Well, um, actually, I think, um, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, I forgot about um, number five, uh, the uh, question that I did uh, before that. Okay. Um, you didn't answer the question. Uh, okay. Um, do you use the term illegals or non-white? Uh, do I use that term illegals? I don't use the term illegals uh, because, as I just explained, I don't think that someone who is trying to come into the country is... Uh, for, okay, for, let's, let's start off. Let's back it up a little bit. I mean, on a personal level, um, you may have heard the phrase, no one is illegal. I subscribe to that. I don't believe that any person can be illegal. I believe that uh, one of the fundamental human rights is that people have the right to migrate, to move from place to place, and that people, it, it, it's not uh, entering a country, just by virtue of entering a country, you can't be classified as illegal. So I, I, not only would I not refer to these African people as illegal, I wouldn't refer to any people as illegals. So I think that answers your question. Okay, do you use the term non-white? To describe those people? In the video, you mean? Yes. Like, yeah, I would refer to, I generally refer to... non-white, period. Period? Um, when it's relevant, you know, when we're trying to describe specifically a group of uh, people who don't have white privilege in the society, then I use it. I generally try to use terms that are as accurate as possible. And, um, I, you know, I g generally, I feel that those people that we're describing uh, are receiving the treatment that they receive specifically because they are sub-Saharan Africans. Uh, and so generally, that's what I call them, African people. You know, or I might... You know, if I know someone personally and know their circumstances, I might say that man from Eritrea or that man from Sudan or that man from or that woman from Cote d'Ivoire or that woman from Central African Republic. Um, how do you feel about that? The white people are trying to push the black people out of Israel. And why are they doing that? Mm -hmm. OK, Um in terms of your first question, I'll answer that first. How do I feel about it? It it's, makes me angry. It makes me sad. And I want to stop it. Um, I don't always know how to stop it. It's because it means changing the minds and hearts of many people, millions of people. Um, one of the ways that I've in my life tried to stop is at least... Um, focusing on it, showing it, you know, broadcasting that with the video that you may have seen on YouTube and, and others and in my articles to to let people know what's occurring so that we can have a conversation about it so it can't be something that occurs in, and, and, and isn't discussed and isn't brought into the light. 
I personally would be very happy if there were more African people in the country that I live in. I think that, you know, people are people, but in my personal experience of having lived in places where there are many more African people, both continental Africans and diasporic Africans, um, then in the city that I live in currently, in the neighborhood that I live in currently, um, my life is only, you know, enhanced, if anything. Yeah, you know, of course, there's, there's good people, bad people everywhere you live, but in general, if I had to make a generalization, um, the places in the world that I've lived where there have been more African descended people, I've had uh, enhanced experiences of community, of culture, of uh, intellectual discussions. Like my life has only been enhanced by it. So I would only be more happy if more African people were living in the place that I'm living now. No. That's the answer to your first question. Um, I think the second question was why do uh, people in Israel want to kick the black people out of the country? Is that correct? That was a restatement of your second question? Yeah. Um, why? You, so the, um, the next question was, why are they doing that? Okay. So I think there's um, two reasons that are connected to each other, at least two reasons. Um, let, uh, let's say I can think of three reasons off the top of my head. One of them is simple white supremacy. Um, as has been discussed in this, you know, I've, I've listened to a couple of shows here, and it, as has been discussed in the show, um, many there are many incidences of white people who want to not have black people around them. They want to not interact with black people in their immediate surroundings. And when the amount of black people in their surroundings is increased, they want to reduce that. So I think one reason is just white supremacy, as has been discussed in this show many times. I think a second reason is um, economics, meaning that people, anytime you have a group of people living in one area and more and more and more people move into the same area, what you have is a competition for resources. There's only a certain amount of jobs that are available. There's only a certain amount of houses or apartments that are available, only a certain amount of schools, certain amount of public parks, certain amount of, uh, you know, like uh, f f facilities. And so anyone living in that area, it's like, just for example, let's say you or I are living in a house with the members of your family your tribe and you have four people to a to a home or to an apartment and then all of a sudden another family moves in and now you're eight people in the same apartment then it's stressful regardless of whether the people are the nicest people in the world purple black green it's it, it, you know short martian from jupiter it doesn't matter because all of a sudden your life is so much more stressful because you have to wait in line to get to the shower. You have to wait in line to get to, to – there's not enough room in the fridge for all your food. So anytime that there's a competition for resources, it doesn't matter who the people – the people who are there first are going to be partly upset by that. So that's one of the factors that's not connected to the Africanness or blackness of, of the people. Um, and the third reason is – uh, what, what I'll call Jewish supremacy. So just as the, and I don't know if this has been discussed on the show before, but just as there's a system, a belief system called white supremacy that says that, you know, white people are superior to non-white people and that, uh, you know, it's a, a system of privileges that it uh, allows white people to benefit at the expense of non-white people, there's also a system of Jewish supremacy, our belief system and, and uh, an actual infrastructure that supports Jewish supremacy, meaning uh, a system of bo bo informal and formal that helps Jewish people advance and people who are not considered Jewish 
to to be dispossessed or to have less privilege in the society. So because these particular African people, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are Jewish people who are African. I talked about North Africans, Jews from uh, what are sometimes called Arab Jews, Jews from uh, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, and, and the uh, the Arab countries of North Africa, but you have also Jews from sub-Saharan Africa, from Ethiopia mainly. Um, but those specific people targeted in the video that you saw are 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 not Jewish people. They don't have Jewish privilege. Uh, their uh, their their religious backgrounds uh, for some of them it's Christianity. For some of them it's Islam. And for some of them, maybe others, but um, mainly Christians and Muslims. And because they don't have Jewish privilege um, in this country, uh, the government seeks to reward people who are considered Jewish. And by virtue of rewarding some people for being Jewish, Therefore, the people who don't get those rewards, who are punished for not having that status, so, so non-Jewish people are at a legal and social disadvantage. They have a harder time because they don't have the full set of uh, rights according to and privileges according to Jewish people. So to answer your question, a combination of three factors off the top of my head, white supremacy, uh, economics, of of just a crowding of, of limited resources and and lots of people and and Jewish supremacy those would be the three reasons. What is Jewish um, supremacy? Okay, so the way that I would describe it is a little bit like um, affirmative action gone wrong, gone horribly wrong is the way that I see it from my perspective. Um, I, I imagine that affirmative action is a phrase that people who are calling into the show are familiar with. You you've, yourself are familiar with this term, right? It's it's used in the United States? Justice, I'm just asking you, you know, you know the term affirmative action, right? I'm I can't sorry? Hear you. Oh, oh, I'm just asking, um, like, when I say the term affirmative action, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Affirmative um, action, you said? Yes, affirmative I, action. Are you, are you familiar with that term? No. Okay, okay. so I'll, I'll just define it the way I understand it. Um, because some people are familiar with that term, so it's uh, like an easy uh, access point to describe the situation, in my opinion. So affirmative action, the way I understand it, is... Uh, one way that uh, in America, at least, and other places where white supremacy has traditionally been practiced and, of course, continues to be, um, affirmative action is a system by which uh, when there is a competition for positions or places, for example, slots in a university campus or housing or jobs or whatever, um, the, the governing board decides to uh, give extra, uh, give an advantage to African-American people in this case, or black people, um, a quota system. And I'm saying, so give them an advantage, make it easier for them by, by, saying, okay, we know that historically in all of these systems that we've described, spots at university, housing, jobs, and currently today, the, but usually people don't want to acknowledge that currently today there is a system of white supremacy, but they'll sometimes acknowledge that it's existed in the past. They'll say historically people, uh, black people, African-American people have been at a disadvantage because people have purposefully selected them out, purposefully uh, not given them jobs or housing or, or or schooling because just of being black. So because of that, because we want to um, acknowledge the crimes of the past and uh, create a, a balance in society, you know, because as a result of all those things, not you know denying housing and and uh, and etc., 
um, it also leads, you know, those are advantage or uh, privileges or opportunities that are lost. And we want to uh, at least feel better about ourselves to, and, and hopefully as some people have the sincere hope, I guess, of uh, uh, giving more opportunities to African-American people. So they say, we're going to uh, look at it as a benefit and give you more uh, opportunities or give you a greater likelihood of getting, whether it's a position in school or in, in housing or in a job. So that's the way I understand it, affirmative action. Now, the way that I look at the policies of the state of Israel that could be called Jewish supremacist, I look at it as, uh, one way to look at it is a, a term of Jewish affirmative action. Because historically, um, Jewish people have suffered some of the same kinds of discrimination in housing, in jobs, in education. We, we can go into examples, um, and I would certainly agree that it's not nearly the amount of discrimination that uh, black people and African-American people have experienced because Jewish people are generally white skinned and so therefore it's easier for them to pass as white people, you know, by changing your name, changing your accent, it's much easier to pass as, as a white person. So therefore there's ways to avoid some of the traditional discrimination that, uh, again, you know, for jobs and, and, and schooling that Jewish people have experienced. But because that certainly has, has existed, that discrimination, both, in the United States and in other countries, both in this time and in previous times. So um, a group of people who established the, what we call the State of Israel here um, 62 years ago, 63 years ago now, they decided that they would establish a, an affirmative action program, meaning that the laws of the state, well, if you read the, the founding you know, documents, the constitutional documents of the state, the, the you know Declaration of uh, Independence of the State of Israel, it says you know, that they do not discriminate on the basis of race, religion, color, etc. But at the same time, in the same breath, it says that you know they will seek to create a, a state in which all Jewish people around the world will feel at home and will have aid. So what that means is that if a Jewish person comes here, they have extra privileges and extra rights. And, and the state will, will, dis, will justify it by saying, you know, all these years we were discriminated against. So now we are just trying to give these people a leg up, you know, give them advantages that they were disadvantaged for for generations, which in theory sounds good. You know, you, you want to help people who were wronged, you know, by historically but the problem is um whether that's like a good policy or not good policy theoretically but in practice what it is meant is that there's many people who live in this country that are not jewish uh you know let's say an estimate would say that a quarter one quarter of the people living in this country and by this country i mean just the official borders of the state of israel one quarter of the people living in this country are not jewish now if you include all the border the, the all the lands that israel has under its own military control that aren't internationally recognized as part of israel but w in which the israeli army exerts direct military control over then the amount of Jewish people would be only 50%. The event of non-Jewish people would be also 50%. So what this means is for the, the system of Jewish supremacy that, that we've described, or the affirmative action program of giving citizenship plus to Jewish people means that all the other people who are not Jewish have citizenship minus. They are disadvantaged. Um, sometimes it's just social racism. Uh, you know, like, for example, people not wanting to be friends with non-Jewish people, people not wanting to date non-Jewish people or marry non-Jewish people, people. But 
again, that's that's social racism, but sometimes it's state sponsored. Sometimes, of course, social racism is inspired by. If you hear that your government is, uh, is racist towards a people, you're more likely to, presumably, if you're predisposed to be racist, you're more likely to feel free to practice that racism. But, but, but what's most troubling is the state sponsored racism, and uh, or or Jewish supremacy. And by that I mean that, um, for example, um, in this country. For the first 20 years of its existence, all of the Arab people living here were under military rule, meaning the first 20 years of this country, all the Arabs living here did not have full civil rights. They could, you know, let, let's say, you know, there's rights. A policeman can't just arrest you for nothing, right? Presumably, you know, under if the law works the way it's supposed to, um, a policeman can't just arrest you. There's rules. They have to have a writ from a judge or they have to have just cause or whatever. But for the first 20 years, the Arab people in this country were not, did not have full civil rights. They were under military rule, meaning as if it's a time of war when the government can kind of do willy-nilly whatever it wants. And so that's, that's an extreme example. Military rule is, is no longer, you know, the people... The Arab people who live in Israel are no longer under military rule, but in the West Bank, the Arab people living there are under military rule. So um, uh, I'm not sure the exact figure, but it, you know it's over a million or a million and a half people, non-Jewish people who live in the West Bank, and it's under Israeli military control, and those people do not have full civil rights. The army can go into their house, you know, and take people from their beds in the middle of the night and, you know, take people for inter- young people, even like teenagers for interrogation without their parents being there, without lawyers being there. And of course, if presumably if the government did that to a Jewish Israeli citizen, just snatched, you know, broke into your house in the middle of the night, snatched you out of your bed, took you away for like a week at a time and without your parents and without your lawyer interrogate you, I mean, that's completely scandalous. It would never be allowed. It's completely illegal. But because the non-Jewish people living in the West Bank don't have full civil rights, uh, that's, that continues to occur. And it has occurred for the last over 40 years in this country. Um, and there's more ways in which non-Jewish people don't have full civil rights. Uh, uh, they don't, like, I could go on and on, but um, I think that gives you a, a sense of some of the ways in which the system of Jewish supremacy operates in this country. Uh, Justice and David, we have uh, 13 minutes left oh, boy. Uh, in the program, and folks did call in, and we're transitioning. I, I think it's important to make sure that uh, we do give listeners a chance to ask a quick question or two. Uh, is that acceptable, everybody? It's fine by me. I hope I've answered your questions well, Justice, or to your satisfaction. And uh, there's just so much to talk about, you know. And I'm trying to talk to the point that uh, this uh, it's, a, it's a lot of stuff here. So, um, but uh, you, you're, you're welcome to call me also at another time if you want to discuss something in greater detail. But I'm, I'm happy to talk to other people as well, as you wish. Is that acceptable, uh, Justice? About like asking questions. Uh, to okay. give an opportunity for some of the people that called in to ask. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, let's see. Uh, the person that called in, uh, it doesn't give numbers. It gives locations. I hope everyone is acceptable with that. Um, if you would prefer not to have your location, the free HD line is open, uh, so you can dial that uh, if you would prefer not to have your location. But just heads up, that's what it is. Um or actually, for some people, if you have a, a handle at TalkShoe, then it'll have your handle. So it'll either have your location or your handle. With that, uh, if you can take, uh, if we can try and go as quick as possible, so we'll try to limit each call to uh, two minutes, see if we can get as much as we can in. Uh, Black Ops, person that called in with the handle Black Ops, your line is open. Did you have a question? Greetings. May I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, I guess the thing I would take issue with uh, with Mr. Sheen is his use of the term sub-Saharan Africa. 
Um, I, I think it's basically racism couched in language, and also I think it's an artificial construct uh, which came about uh, from the uh, the Caucasians uh, which colonized uh, the African continent. And secondly, um, I also take issue with the fact that uh, he he made a comment about uh, those individuals those those individuals who call themselves Jews in the part of the world called Israel that they were the first there. Um, isn't it true, Mr. Sheen, that that those Caucasian uh, uh, so-called Jews that they were largely immigrants from Europe and that the uh, the Sephardic Jews or the so-called Arabs were there first? Hmm. Uh, first of all, uh, Carl, I thank you for your comments regarding the terminology of Sub-Saharan African. Uh, I'll think about that some more. I think it's a, uh, a good comment. Um, in ter- I, your second comment, I don't think I ever claimed that the Jews were here first. I, I don't think I ever made such claim. I, I don't think I would. Um, even by the Jews' own account, uh, if you go to the, the biblical narrative, it says that there were – that. Again, like the, there's no proof that this biblical narrative is actually historically based. No one's ever proved that, but at, at least all of it. But certainly, even according to their own narrative, if the ancestors of the people who call themselves Jews uh, originate from Iraq, uh, from the city of Ur, if I'm not mistaken. And th- those people migrated to what's called Israel today, and that when they arrived here, they found many other nations here. Uh, the Girgashite, the Prizite, the Hittite, the Hivite, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera the Canaanites. So um, I don't think even by the Jews' own admission that they would say that, you know, if you, if you prodded and poked it, like their own founding, you know, establishment documents would, would claim otherwise. Um, in terms of Sephardic versus Ashkenazic, I guess we're now referring to the recent waves of immigration from the, that. Uh, the increased migration of Jewish people that have arrived in the last, let's say, 130 years, for the most part, um, that uh, that's been pretty well documented, and uh, certainly the the people that, um, that migrated here from the European countries uh, that were instrumental. Oh, yeah. yeah. My apologies for interrupting. Um, I just wanted to try to get in as many callers, and I, I feel like this one could uh, – you could probably spend a lot of time. Right, uh, right. Expensive okay. answer. Um, okay, so we'll leave it with the answer that I gave so far, that, that no, they're not the first peoples here. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps we can get David to come back and uh, continue the dialogue. He has a lot of content, videos, and, and articles, so if he you know, would be willing to chat with us again yeah. and perhaps – Yeah, see, but we didn't even get to talk about the, like, the black Hebrews, the African Hebrew Israelites, because their story is, is just amazing and really shed some light on some of these issues. But again, we can do that another time perhaps. For sure. Go ahead. I wanted uh, the gentleman, uh, the black male, in one of your uh, videos, uh, Nasik. Emmanuel Ben Yahuda. Am I, I'm sure that's I'm right. butchering his name. No, no, uh, no, it's pretty good. Oh, okay. If if he would be, you know, willing to to talk about his experience, we would love to have him on the program. If uh, you could facilitate with that, that would be great. Wow. Um, I'm very happy to like pass that information on to Nasir and to um, uh, Ahmadiel and some of the other people that I also interviewed in the community. Okay. Yeah. Outstanding. Um, I'll I'll shoot you an email after the program. Yeah, I would. Cool. I think that would be great if they uh, if they would be interested. Mm-hmm. Um, Pam, uh, co-author of Trojan Horse. Uh, thanks for calling in. Your line, I believe, is. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. I think your line is open. If you have a question for. Oh, really? Good. Yo. Hello? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Oh, okay. I heard some other thing. Uh, uh, good afternoon uh, to your guests. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Gus and Justin. So good to have you back. It, you know, just I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to say I was listening, and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, and I'm just glad to be having this experience again. So I'll move on and let another caller uh, ask a question. Cool. Cool. Thanks for being part of the show. Sure. Um, Pam? I saw that. Uh, Pam? Uh-huh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. I forgot to say hi, but, um, hello. Hi, Good to hear your voice. Let's see. Uh, the person that called in Western Michigan, <laughs> did you have a qu- Oh, wait a minute. The line is hopping around. 
Okay. Uh, the person that called in from Western Michigan, did you have a question? Western Michigan? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Can I, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Oh, how you doing? I, I just have uh, want more clarity, should I say. Uh, um, caught saying Jewish, and I'm wondering what is the difference between a Jew and a Jewish, and really what is the definition of a Jew? Uh, you say they come from Iraq area, but what is a, a Jew? And uh, that's it. I'll just mute, mute myself. Okay. Um, thank you for your call. What you're touching on now is such an – it's very important, very interesting, and there's no way that I or pretty much anyone can um, answer it in such a short time. Really, really, guess we really should do another show because this is interesting stuff. Um, terminology is, uh, is is a funny thing. I would say that historically uh, people have used the word Jew. Um, some people would say that Jewish is is a way to uh, soften the blow of the word Jew, you know, English, Spanish. So it, you're only sort of Jew. Like a, if you just say someone, a, you're a Jew, right? It's it's like saying that's the sum totality of who you are. And uh, some people don't like to be pigeonholed and they don't like to be labeled purely on the basis of either their religious beliefs or their ethnic group or their nationality. And the, the kind of the interesting thing about uh, Jewishness or is that it's all of those things, or, or at least different people would claim that it's each of those things. You know, for some people, it's a religion. For some people, it's an ethnicity. For some people, it's a nationality. And so it doesn't really fit neatly into any one distinct category. Although some people would say it's only one thing, but there's people who claim that it is each of those things or several of those things. Um, and to unpack that stuff would take more than just a couple minutes. And I'm happy to do so. Or, and there, I'm sure there's other people who can also do that. Um, but but I think unpacking that really helps uh, people understand, you know, some of the the issues that are that are at stake here around race and and around the the conflicts here in Israel as well. So I'm sorry that I can't fully answer that, but um, we could do that another time. Uh, person that called in from Texas, Texas, did you have a question? Greetings, Gus. This is 404 and Pam. Justice, happy birthday to you <laughs> and to the guests. You are Thank so you. welcome, my dear. And this is going to be real quick because Gus, you, as you said, this, this call, he will have to come back so that we can get into it because I had a question along the same line. It's going to be very lengthy, so I'm not going to tie him up. But because it was just curious to me that the Caucasian Jews, they can they can be born anywhere in the world and guarantee citizenship when you get to Israel, but from what I'm hearing that the black and the Sephardim, they're the only ones that are given um having issues when they get to Israel. The Ashkenazis, they can pretty much walk in and guarantee a spot, but not the Falashas or the Sephardim. Um, I, I would certainly agree that um, th there is a system of white supremacy that overlays the, uh, like, that the, that white Jews are the ones who are mainly in power in this country. And so because of that, for example, um, they facilitated the immigration, the, the state facilitated the immigration of about one and a half million Russian people, or people from the uh, the former Soviet Union in uh, the last 20 years or so, uh, the, who were light-skinned, fair-skinned people. And uh, whether... <laughs> Fair, fair, you know, well, no, but more so than let's say, like, there's ca Caucasoid people, you know, ra races, you know, whatever. It's a fiction, but the, like, people who are even m more on the spectrum of Caucasoidal features, or you know, th they are even f further. They're they're Northern European peoples. With often they are with like light skin, fair hair, fair eyes, or, or bright eyes, and those people um, were brought into the country with little filtering, you know, whereas the people who were brought in from Ethiopia, for example, 
had to go through much greater difficulty. And still now, there are people from Ethiopia of Jewish ancestry who want to come and find a much harder time vis-a-vis the, the help that they're given from the state in order to immigrate to the country. That is true. Um, uh, Sephardic is, is um, usually refers to the Jews from the Middle Eastern countries. And there, today, there are very few Jews still living in the Middle Eastern countries. So, um, and I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case that their immigration was made more difficult. It, it, maybe their acclimatization, like the the uh, help that they got when they got here, the circumstance, the way the state treated them when they were here was poor. But their immigration wasn't put up to a test, the way that it was put to. Uh, black Jews from Africa, like Ethiopia. In, the, in those cases, uh, they, they, they often had to go through, and still do go through the ringer, prove their so-called Jewishness, the way that um, white Jewish people from Europe and North America and such have a much easier time with it, I would say. Hmm. Uh, Non-Mighty Wick, Non-Mighty Wick, did you have a question for David? Hello, can I be heard? Yes, Hello. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you well. Okay, Thank yeah. you. Uh, Mr. Sheen, uh, mm-hmm. I believe earlier in the broadcast, today's program, you, you said that um, uh, the black people there in Israel um, enhanced your life. I was hoping uh, that you would be willing to share um, and be honest uh, specifically what, what the black people have uh, done uh, for you, uh, to you, with you. Uh, to enhance your life. Okay. Um, well, actually, I, I, I think I said that uh, all the places that I've lived in my life previous to this, I also um, lived in Oakland, California for a period of time in which I lived in a neighborhood that was over 90% African American. And also, I spent several months in Africa, in Ghana, in, in Ethiopia, in, in those places that I lived, you know you know, like 99% black people. Um, So in uh, not only now living in Tel Aviv, but all the places that I've lived where there have been significant amounts of black people, you know, I felt that my experience of life was enhanced. And in terms of some examples of that, I mean, I, uh, you know, I really enjoy, for for example, um, the friendships of people that I've had, but, you know, friendship, uh, it's not a, a specific African uh, or African American quality, but for example, I would say, let's say, for example, Ethiopian food. I love Ethiopian food, you know, and it's only because Ethiopian people moved to Israel and also to other parts of the world, like Canada and the United States, and have opened up restaurants and have shared their 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 cuisine heritage with people that I was able to have this world open up to me. Also, um, music. You know, I listened to uh, African music from, you know, East African music, like Ethiopian music and, and West African music, like, you know, some Nigerian and Ghanaian music. And uh, that's, you know, and, and also if you think about a lot of American music is like really, really strongly influenced by West African music. Uh, it, I mean, it goes back and forth, of course, but so, uh, you know, those, those experiences, those aesthetic experiences, those sensual experiences of culinary experiences, of music experiences that are so fundamental in terms of what makes us human and what enhances our human experience, you know, and of course, the friendships, the human component. Um, so those, uh, those are, I say, three things that... Uh, three ways in which the African people's uh, diasporic and continental African peoples have enhanced my life whenever they've been part of it. Okay. Um, I can follow up real quick. I, I believe in sure. this broadcast you did, you did admit that you say you are a white person and you are a, a racist. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Uh, I did, said that earlier in the show and I would confirm that that is true. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, it seems like you're attempting to be, you know, uh, somewhat honest and as honest as, as you can be. I hope this, this carries on to my next question. I wanted to know, um, oh boy. You know, are you now or have you ever been in a sexual relationship with a black person? 
I have and I am. That's an honest answer to your question. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Oh, oh, sorry. I have been and I am currently. You, you have been and you are currently having sex with a black non-white person. Is, is that, is that yeah, I, I, let, me, let, me ref, let me rephrase my question. I, I rephrase my answer. I am in, I have in the past and I am currently in an intimate physical relationship with a black person. That's correct. Wow. 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 To be, to be, cl- to be okay. clear, my wife is my wife is black. Does she does she know that you're a racist? Yeah, she's standing beside me right here. She's hearing this whole conversation. Oh my god. Okay. Thank you. I just I just wanted to know. Appreciate it. No problem. Let's see. Um the person that called in East Maryland, did you have a question? East Maryland, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Groovy. Uh, We are at the two-hour point. Wow. Really enjoyed the broadcast. Um, And we didn't even get to the the article that came out today, um, which is linked. I put it on my Facebook page. Um, Really interesting report. I mean, you you actually have video as well. Where uh, oh, well, actually, that's not it's not linked in the section for today's uh, report. The video is that correct? I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, the video. Oh, it is. It is. It is the it video is, is, is better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Check out the video. You'll get to hear from if you scroll down. The gentleman that I want to come on the program. I don't want to butcher his name again, but um, black it's, man. It's Nasir, which means prince. Okay. Nasir Emmanuel Ben Yehuda. Okay. So just Emmanuel, son of Judah, Prince Emmanuel, son of Judah, Nasir Emmanuel Ben Yehuda. Wow. I'm so happy I have this recorded so I can play that back a few times and then I'll practice and I'll be <laughs> good to go. Um, yeah. Wow. Oh, but yeah. That's, that's, that's with, a, this with a, a white accent. I mean, if I said it in like Hebrew, Hebrew, it, you know, it'd be like Nasir Emmanuel Ben Yehuda. Like there's, you know, there's a whole other levels we could take it to because, you know, you use the, 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 the back of the throat more when you speak the Hebrew language. It's, it's a bit different, but that's perfectly good. I'm sure you're doing great, you know. I will practice. I will practice. Okay. Um, okay. I'll improve. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if you go, if you click on the report, um, and it's at, uh, I'm going to butcher this too, Haaretz, uh, H-A-A-R-E-T-Z dot com. Can you give us the correct pronunciation? That That's that's pretty good. Haaretz. Haaretz. There you go. Haaretz dot com. Uh, it's linked, uh, and the title is Recalling Their Show of Strength. Uh was just... Uh, published today (laughs) just came out um you can check it out it's a great report and you'll get to see uh black people um trying to do something about racism i mean he's talking about malcolm x and marcus garvey i mean it's uh it's good stuff um Mm -hmm. check it and we hopefully we can get get them on the program that would be even better um Mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoyed the dialogue um yeah, and I, I hope you uh, you felt like we were honest and, and challenged. I will say that the the language when when I hear white people use the term white privilege and saying that white people are racialized or that uh, white people have white skin privilege, uh, and I've heard, I think one of the other terms I've heard white people say is recovering racist. When I hear that, I feel mm-hmm. like white people, uh, or I believe white people are practicing racism, perhaps consciously, deliberately because it's like a denial you think it's like a denial of it's a very passive way of of speaking Mm. about a system of terrorism it's a very passive Mm. way of doing so and And not acknowledging their complicity in it and their active complicity exactly exactly Mm. active and deliberate participation Mm. um and it's um it's it's putting you on the doorstep of saying that white people are victims. Like, man, I just got mm. here and I was trying to be a human person and I keep getting this privilege. Like somebody is just <laughs> putting a gun to your head and here's this sack of white privilege and you're gonna take it like, Oh no, 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 I wanna be a good person. no, no, you're gonna take this white and I mean that's just total foolish. It's racism, white supremacy, like uh, just, you know, let's tell the truth. It's not white people being passive about this. It's white people being very active 
and making sure that the non-white people stay under their foot. And when it looks like that, you know, that control is slipping, white people get busy. And I mean, there's evidence worldwide from you've got tons of videotapes mm. where when white people feel like that's slipping, uh, they get busy. Mm. Yes, I I agree with everything you just said. I mean, it's I think that obviously certain people are more active, certain people are less active, certain people are have greater agency, but certainly it's it's active. You know, it's an active we're we're active participants in it, and uh, we shouldn't deny that, and we should uh, acknowledge it. And maybe they can act, you know, participate in it and participate against. It. But I think that it's wrong to deny that we're actively participating and perpetuating it. Mm. We definitely will uh, be looking to get a, a part two because uh, I okay. think listeners would would be interested. I know this Israel is is a very interesting area to discuss, and I know uh, a lot of my listeners probably their first time hearing someone live from Israel speaking about white supremacy. So yeah, if you'd be willing to come back and chat. We would love to, uh, yeah, do a part two, and and definitely cool. um, the black male. And if you know more than one, uh, the black male uh, that you know you had in the video presentation, it would be phenomenal. If, uh, if we would love to have him as a guest, if he would, you know, be interested, mm. we would love to speak with him. Yeah, I I will be very happy to pass on uh, his information. I don't actually have his email, but um, Another brother that I interviewed at the same time because uh, there was uh, there were four people in that room when I interviewed and um, uh, the the other brother is kind of like the um, one of the, one of the spokespeople for the community and he organized that meeting of four people so I could interview all four of them. I'll pass on his information to you so and you can ask him you know whether it's about talking to Nasir or uh, himself or, or other people who are willing. I think that there's so much you. you you could do just several shows just on their experience. It's just a treasure trove of interesting information that I think um, really people, especially African American people, should know more about. Like in in my mind, they uh, it, it's like a it's like a part of Amer- African American history that uh, is is such a huge important chapter that is, sadly is uh, very little is known about. Hmm. Uh, I'm I'm very ignorant uh, about you know black people and non-white people that area of the world in general I'm mm-hmm. very ignorant mm-hmm. so I would I would definitely appreciate the opportunity to learn more cool. and uh, I will I'll follow up as soon as the program concludes um, cool. yeah definitely check out the the website and his YouTube page um, I will link all of that information in the descriptions um, yeah. at Blog Talk and at Talk Shoe so you can see the YouTube videos you can go to uh, Haaretz dot com you can check out uh, all of his articles uh really interesting material and uh, hopefully we'll have him back so we can you yeah. know go further into detail cool. um david just, sheen the, I, the website is just david sheen.com like a lot of stuff that i do is all like yeah definitely if, to go to the articles you were referring to you're going to have specific links if there's any other stuff you're interested in a lot of the stuff i put up is that just my name david sheen d-a-v-a-i-d s-h-e-e-n.com that's a little plug there that's it Oh, sweet. DavidSheen.com. I'll link that okay. as well. That's, uh, yeah, okay. check out. I like giving out information. Um, Justice, unless you have uh, anything you want to get in really quick? Um, nope. Grooving. Thank you for sharing some of your Friday evening with us, David. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, look forward to having you on the program again. Okay. Thanks a lot. You could take good care, Gus. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. All right. Good evening. Context of white supremacy. Um, yeah, looking forward to uh, looking forward to having David back on the program. Very uh, very interesting uh, information uh, about uh, the area of the world known as Israel. Um, I will tell you, I was thinking though uh, during the broadcast, um, I want to speak with Mr. Fuller and. Uh, that Jewish thing, like uh, just hearing a white person, a person who has admitted, yes, I'm white, yes, I'm racist. I don't really need anything else. Like, I don't care. Anything else you want to tack on, I mean, that's just, you know, lesbian, liberal, uh, Jewish, hat maker, pharmacist, drug dealer, 
video game maker. Like, you know, I, that's, you know, you can just put all that to the side. <laughs> you're white and you're okay. Got it. That's really all I need. Um, that's why I don't even ask. I think uh, someone did ask me, you know, did you ask if he was a, a so-called Jew? And, uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't even remember to ask. It's like, oh, you're white and you are racist. Got it. All I need to know. Um, yeah, at any rate, I definitely would be interested to have him back on the program because he does have a lot of, of reports and videos that, uh, you know, I think have constructive information. And, I mean, he has white people uh, out in the streets like mad protesting, saying that these uh, white people, you know, need to be uh, – excuse me, these non-white people need to be gone. Like he has this on video uh, and them calling the area where these non-white people live garbage town. He has this on video. It's uh, fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Um, it, it, even man, he even has one video. There's a white woman and uh, a black male. Looks like a black male to me. Uh, looks like a white woman to me. I'm not sure. At any rate, um, the black male comes up, and this white woman, she says, uh, "You're a rapist. You're a thief. Uh, you're a mur- I mean, it's just like what? It sounded like Daryl Bain. Like Daryl Bain just out in the street yelling. Uh, at a black person. It was, uh, man. Mm -hmm. Anyway, hopefully we'll get him back on the program. I hope it was constructive, but definitely, I I definitely want to call Mr. Fuller. There's something about that that Jewish thing that just, uh, I don't know what the enchantment is. Like, I just don't need, once a white person tells me that they're racist, really, once you tell me you're white, that's all I need. But I mean, you're white and you admit to being a racist? Whatever. Everything else is just, you know, you just talking and, you know, probably practicing racism. Anyway, um, at that point, I'll go to the phone lines to see if folks uh, have anything to share. I do want to say we'll be back uh, tomorrow. Uh, We'll be broadcasting. The white people at Blog Talk, I don't know. um, That account has not been deleted. Um, I I mean, that could happen any time. They might have deleted it since I checked last, but they have not at this point. So uh, what I'm going to do is just use it to promote because people still do get the phone updates and uh, people can still download, you know, the previous programs. We just can't do two hour programs anymore. Uh, So I'll just put the information up so that it'll be available there. And then we'll broadcast from TalkShoe at the same time. So you'll have a full program here and uh, yeah, we'll just, you know, now we'll have two sites. Great. Uh, And the goal is still personal website for the cows. Uh, This is all just, temporary compensating for white people, uh, most likely practicing white supremacy. Uh, but we will be back tomorrow. Uh, we'll be uh, broadcasting at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it's the program about racism and education. Uh, I would like as many people as possible to call in. Uh, everybody gets five minutes to share uh, a story on racism, white supremacy, and uh, you can, I think, call it last time he said he he had, you know, a plethora of incidents, unfortunately. And if you have more than one incident, if you can get them in in five minutes, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. So, you know, if you have one incident that you want to share, that's fine. If, you know, there are multiple and you can get them in in five minutes, that's fine. But I would would like to hear from as many people as possible. Uh, Hopefully some people from outside the states, because I'm sure there are non-white people worldwide uh, who have, you know, just terrible incidents of abuse and trauma uh, under white supremacy in education. And again, all areas, student, uh, K through 12, uh, graduate school, whatever, Uh, if you're a staff, if you've been a teacher, faculty member, um, just whatever, you know, PTA meeting, any any level of education, uh, if you have an incident of racism join us, um, we, we would definitely be interested in hearing. I, I, I think it would be constructive just for us to catalog uh, what it is to be a non-white person, a victim of racism, and to attend school under white supremacy. Um, that's Saturday, uh, April 23rd. Uh, we will have two programs on – we will have two programs on Sunday, April 24th, the children's program uh, that will be – the program number one, uh, that'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Uh, Central, and 12 noon Pacific. Um, children, nine and up, call in. Um, Justice will be here. Um, and we're hoping, hopefully the fifth grader that called in before, hopefully he'll be uh, present 
and uh, the children that we had on back uh, Christmas, so-called Christmas Eve. Um, if you know children, if you have children, they're over nine, and you think you know they would be interested in talking honestly about racism, white supremacy, that will broadcast uh, this Sunday. Uh, the free HD line will be open. TalkShoe will be open. You can call in. Uh, the second program uh, this Sunday will be 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, and 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it will be uh, Jeremiah Kamara, um, his second visit to the cows. Uh, he was on so-called Christmas Day. Uh, quite fitting he'll be returning for so-called Easter Sunday. Um, but that'll be the second broadcast. Uh, that'll be broadcasting at Blog Talk. Uh, and talk to you, and the uh, free HD line will be open. It's open now. Uh, the free HD line is open, so if people have Skype, you can uh, use free HD for Skype, or you can dial in. So, uh, yeah, the the context of white supremacy continues. Uh, at any rate, I will go to the. Oh, wait a minute. We got to do news justice. Do you have a news article? Uh, Justice, are you still with us? Yes. Oh, okay. Do you have a uh, news report? Um, no. Okay, dokie. I uh, was checking uh, during the program. I'm very serious about uh, making sure that uh keep a news report every program, and uh, I checked racismdaily.com, and uh, the racism in schools <laughs> – very fitting, unfortunately, uh, given the broadcast that we're going to do tomorrow. But uh, there was an update on the Port Huron High School incident that we've been reporting on. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, there was a new incident uh, also in Michigan. Port Huron, if you remember, that was in Michigan. They had the racist hit list in the bathroom. Uh, this incident, this was reported uh, Wednesday, April 20th. Uh, this is in Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, this article is on clickondetroit.com in the news section, and the title is Racist Graffiti Found at High School, Police Investigating Threats Found on Bathroom Wall in Birmingham, Michigan. Birmingham police are investigating the discovery of racially charged graffiti on some bathroom walls inside Seaholm High School. In a letter... Principal Terry Piper said the graffiti was found Wednesday afternoon inside a men's bathroom. The names of five African-American students were listed, saying they should be lynched, Local 4 has learned. We take this incident very seriously and are making every effort to determine the students responsible. Any student found to be responsible will be punished, including suspension, Piper wrote. The graffiti was removed but it is stirring emotions at the school that has more than 1,200 students. It's just really sad to think someone would do something like that, said Ashley Averill, a Seaholm High School senior. I know a lot of students here, and it just doesn't sound like Seaholm students. Sounds like racism, white supremacy to me. Now, if you catch this in isolation, this is, you know, oh, that's, you know, just... Uh, poor incidents, you know, some some knucklehead students, you know, that's that's no big deal. But when you see this and poor Huron and it just keeps the incident at the University of Kentucky, when you see this over and over and over and around the world, um, then it starts to paint a very different picture. And I hope the program tomorrow will further flush out that picture of what it's like to try to attend school just to get education, knowledge information, just to try to get information, what that's like for a non-white student under white supremacy. Again, please call in tomorrow. Um, it's not going to be me talking. I really just want to be going to callers for the whole program, giving people five minutes. I hope we get as many people uh, as possible, as many people as possible. Share it, tell friends. Um, you know, if there's five people in the household that listen to the cows, I'd like to hear from all five people because I'm sure uh, there is no shortage of sad pitiful, uh, terroristic incidents uh, under education and white supremacy. Uh, Justice, did you have any thoughts on the article? Um, no, I don't believe so. No. Uh, I will uh, hit the phone lines. Um, I'll go through individually and, and see out of the people that called in who uh, 
is interested in chatting. Pam, your line is open. Uh, the person that called in Southwest Louisiana, uh, did you were you interested in speaking, or are you just listening? Uh, hey, guys, I'm just listening right now. Thanks. No worries. Good to hear from you, sir. Uh, non Mighty Wick, your line is open. Uh, the person that called in from Western Michigan, uh, were you interested in speaking, or did you uh, just listening? So, bro, I just, uh, uh, yeah, bro, I just, I just say, want to say the same thing about the the Jew, the Jew thing. Uh, oh, wait a minute, hang uh, on, I want to get, I want to get the, oh, and can, no speakerphone, please. Oh, uh, no. I'm, I'm not on the speaker. Oh, I don't know I'm if it's headset. Okay, I don't know if it's you, but I'm I'm echoing. I shouldn't be echoing. Uh, oh, it's probably where I'm working at. Uh, it's got like uh the walls. Oh, okay. Uh, kind of get an echo, but I just want to say, yeah. Um, does that work better? Let's see. Um, not really. <laughs> oh well, I just um. I'll I'll just say some I'll just mute myself and say something later. But yeah, I just wanted to say uh, it was a Jew thing that kept. I just want I want to know. I'm I wish I'm hoping you get him back because I want him to be able to define the difference between a Jew and Jewish, and so that I can have more clarity on this racism thing that is being caused by a lot of Jews or people that call themselves Jews or whatever they are Jewish people. White Jews, as, I mean, what, what are they trying to say? So I can define what is a Jew and know the difference between the racism of a Jew and racism of a non-Jew or whatever. Mm. Um, you know, but I'll just be on mute for right now. Mm. Okay. I see if my echo is gone. Oh, my echo is gone. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm going to get the other people they called in. I just wanted to say really quick, that's that's what I was thinking as I was listening. You're not going to get any clarity with the Jewish thing. Uh, it's not going to get clear. You can listen for days, and you will not get clear. Uh, you can listen to him talk and anybody else talk. It's not it's not going to get any clearer than it is. It's just going to get uh, further and, and further away from the truth. Uh, he said he was white. He said he was racist. Just Focus on that. The problem is white people. Focus on, and particularly if you get a white person that says, yes, I'm a racist, man, the antenna should be way up uh, with that white person. Um, that's just my opinion. I do not believe that Jewish thing is going to get you any clarity. Uh, it's just going to be very confusing, and it'll be buckets and buckets of words that'll, you know, it'll be a lot of talking, a lot of talking. Uh the person that dialed in from East Maryland, were you interested in talking or are you just listening? Uh, no, sir. That's on this is me. I'm at work right now, so just listening. Oh, right on, right on. Good to hear from you. Good to hear from you. Uh, let's see. Uh, 404, Atlanta, gotcha. And uh, Black Ops, Black Ops, speaking, listening. Uh, just listening, guys. Groovy. I'm here, guys. Good to hear from you. Okay. Everybody that called in that wanted to talk, your lines are open. Uh, feel free. Well, it's Pam there because we need to have somebody to intellectualize this one here. All right. <laughs> because this man said his wife was standing right next to him, and he admitted he was a racist. And he said he was married to a non-white black female, and I'm assuming that she's probably from somewhere in East Africa. So I, she probably didn't come from the U.S. and went, went with him when he moved from Oakland. As he said, he liked to hang around with black people and lived in, he liked the food, the culture, the music, you know, the typical artificial things. Hello? Are we still there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I don't know what happened. It went quite, very quiet. But, you know, it, it, this, this just goes to show, Gus, this is really and truly just got, what got to show that we have people we don't want to name call. But this is just amazing to me that I'm standing next to my husband. At least I had got to know that this man was an admitted racist 
before I even made it to this point, to being married and, you know, living happily, so-called happily ever after. And plus, I'm standing in the kitchen next to him, and he's admitting this to me. Do you know my bags? I would be in the bedroom getting my stuff together, and um, by the time this his show would have been over, I would have been out the door. I'd been passing him on the way while he was talking to you. Mm. That's what I would have been doing. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that speaks to the confusion of non-white people. I think the non, unfortunately, the non-white people who have that level of clarity to say, oh, my gosh, there's no way, you know, that I can be married to a racist, wouldn't end up in that situation in the first place. You know, it's it's so unfortunate, but, I mean, it just speaks to the level of confusion um, of non-white people. And, in fact, I think it got recorded. I think if you go back and listen, when he said, when he was responding to the question, are you a racist, and he said yes, he said, my wife is standing next to me and she's laughing. I think I think that got recorded. If you go back and listen, I think that got recorded. Oh, definitely, I'm going to play it back because this is, you know, Gus. I had two conversations with two people earlier this week. One of them was a um a non-white black male, and the other was a non-white um black female. The first thing that these individuals said to me was that um I didn't know who they were married to. They were both were married involved in in their marriage to white. The first thing that they said to me was that it's not about racism, it's about classism. It's about the haves and the have-nots. The minute they said that, something told me that something wasn't right about this conversation. And when I probed a little bit deeper, that's when I found out that these people were involved in relationships with white people. And it's in order for these people to sit comfortable in their relationship, they have got to put race out of the matter, and they have to come up with all of these isms in order for them to feel comfortable. And I told them, I said, look, I said, it's about, it's about racism. I said, you can call it whatever you want. It's about racism. I said, you can walk down the street, and you are going to be stopped, and you're going to be frisked, and you're going to be arrested. I said, if your wife is not or her husband is not with you, then you're going to be suspect automatically. So you can call it what you want, and you can come up with classism, the us versus them, the poor versus the rich. And I was going to try and bring in this nonsense and say, oh, well, think about the poor whites, you know, they, they're unemployed. And I said, look, I don't feel nothing for, for, for poor white people. I said, I'm worrying about myself. I'm worrying about the poor blacks. I'm not concerned about poor white people. I said, as far as I'm concerned um, with white, poor white people, so they can go to hell. I said it just like that. I said, you, we are bleeding to death, and you are steady worrying about somebody else's pain rather than bandaging your own wounds. This just shows you that we have a mental illness. As Dr. Cambon said, we have got a serious psychological illness. And the black female, she was in her 40s, and the, um, the non-white uh, male, he was in his 20s that were involved in these relationships. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I say the same thing. Um, um, uh, what you said about Jew, uh, and uh, what the young lady 404 is saying uh, right now about that incident. Uh, my my uh, question was really based on um, him describing what it is, so that I can refer this to my family members who see Jews as this special group of people uh, that are godly, basically, because yeah, uh, they're Christians. Because they're Christians, and so I, I wanted them to, I, I want to be able to to know if he can explain. Because I know he couldn't. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm just letting you know. I know he he couldn't really uh, explain what a Jew is, but you know he is seemingly intelligent. He's very very good with his words, so. I want to know how much information he's going to uh, divulge about the history of the Jew and the Jewish. Um, and he, he he did a little bit of it, but he, of course he didn't go in depth. But it, it, it would help me, uh, basically. The reason why it would help me, because, yeah, I realized what you said. He, he says he's white, he's racist. That's all I need to know. But the, their level of Confusion is so great. Um, you have black people calling themselves Jews. So if you're Jewish, then 
this is the ideology that you're following, and whose ideology are you following, hmm. and the difference between the two. So it, it's just my argument uh, with uh, the ideology. But other than that, um, it's still all white supremacy, and, and that's the end all. But yes. it, you got to get there for them to recognize that it's white supremacy. You're correct. Is is this Pam? Hello, Pam, out there. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Thank, thank goodness we have some sanity, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> how are how's everyone out there? All the listeners. Uh, I don't have any more clarity than you do, but the one thing I have noticed, and I would recommend everyone read this book, Pieces of a Puzzle, by Renicia Tate. I have it. Uh, okay. Uh, I haven't finished it, but I do remember one thing that she said, I think, and that was that she has so she interviewed a lot of white males uh regarding black women and, and this and that and I think this one white male uh, she asked, I think she asked a question something like, Why do you think black women uh, get involved with you or why do you think they they agree to be sexually involved with you? And and I believe he said because they're afraid to say. Afraid to say no, afraid not to. And one thing I have noticed, at least within my own family and social circle, is most of the black women who are involved with white men have been white identified. And I will say this about white men. They don't get involved, in my opinion, with black women who are not willing to succumb and submit to white supremacy. So I'm not surprised he had a white, a, a, a black, a non-white female, a black female next to him who was listening to this. She would not be with him if she was not somebody that he felt comfortable with. So, and, and somebody who didn't feel comfortable with being with a racist, she wouldn't be with him in the first place. So, uh, I think they, they, white males who get involved with black females, they pick very well, as opposed to as opposed to black and non-white people who pick white people. They don't often pick very well, but white people are very good at picking black people that they can be involved with. In my opinion, you're right about that. Because, as you said, you have to submerge yourself in a relationship like this. And black women, they, they get involved with them because of some kind of perceived gain, that they felt that they have moved up the ladder in some way, that a symbol that this man is going to give them access to certain things. And some of them who, as you said, white identified, they're still with this children to come out looking a certain way. They want the curly hair, light-skinned children. And they're also confused, and I would say that's the biggest reason they're with them, is it is not normal to be with someone from a group that is oppressing and, 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 and victimizing you. And it's not normal to have children with a person whose group is going to oppress and continue to victimize your own children. And if, what I found is the white people that are with non-white people and have children with non-white people, they do not oppose white supremacy, even knowing that their children are going to be victims of it. So anybody, to me, a non-white person that gets involved to the extent of having children and getting married, we can just, I can just automatically say whatever it is they're there for. The one reason they're there for is because they're greatly confused. Well, it doesn't really make any sense. I mean, not rational sense. It's not a logical, it's not a logical thing to do, in my opinion. Speaking about irrational behavior, if y'all get a chance out there and y'all pull up PBS, Henry Lewis Skip Gates have a series that's out. You know his um, Blacks in Latin America is out. And his, he's doing a four-part series covering the whole Latin American Blacks in that area, going back to the, tri- um, the transatlantic. And this week, the show that he did is on Haiti and the Dominican Republic. If you watch that show with Dominicans, one thing I have to say about the Haitians versus the, the Dominicans, Haitians are very black identified. They wear their hair natural. I did not see a lot of perm here. I see a lot of natural hair with black with plaits, individual braids, no Korean hair in their head. The the Haitian people go over to the Dominican side. They could be black as um as the ace of space, and they all have that um chemically altered hair. So if you get a chance, please watch them and have your notepad because I was scribbling it down furiously. I was writing these notes. Because they took all of their heroes, I kid you not, if you go into their independence hall, they cast them in marble and they've all white, they all turn them into white men. 
even though they were black, and the, the, the woman explained it, she said the Dominican culture is that they are tied to Spain. They consider themselves to be Spaniards first and foremost and not blacks. While the Haitians, they consider themselves to be blacks with links to Africa more so than anything else. And then you remember they kicked uh, they kicked the Europeans and the mulattoes. Uh, I mean, they, they you know I won't say they kicked all of them out, but they kicked out a lot of the mulattoes. Uh, and I suspect that to me was what was so tragic about the earthquake in Haiti was mm-hmm. this, this country had been penalized for for such a long time ever since they uh, got rid of the colonizers, and now they're being vulnerable again to being recolonized. So that was the thing that was tragic. But uh, but yeah. Please watch that series because the show, like you said with these, like Dr. Chancellor Williams said in the book, Destruction of Black Civilization, they showed the general who was in charge, Trujillo, in the Dominican Republic. He was in charge from 1930 to 1961. He was a mulatto. This man despised blacks. I did not know that they had a slaughter. They called it Massacre River. This man ordered his troops to open fire on the Haitians that was on the island, and they killed over 20,000 of them in 1937. So when you make these children with these white people and, they, and this is what is going to happen to you, they're going to become your oppressors and your killers. I did have a question for Gus. Uh, your, your guest, uh, David Sheen, you mentioned something about the videos that he had or something of, uh, of, of how the non-white people were being treated in Israel. Was there a website? Yes. Uh, I will link that information. Um, okay. I just decided kind of uh, relatively last minute about uh, broadcasting at Blog Talk and Talk Shoe. Um, so I will put that information in both sites. But he has a YouTube page. And he has um, a page on the haaretz.com as well where you can see all of his posts. And he does have a lot of articles that are about racism. He, uh, I'm trying to think if there's another, something else to refer you to. He also has another video page. Uh, he just mailed me these videos before the program. Uh, and they're, man, he, uh, he has a segment in one of these other videos, and I'll just link all this information. It'll be in the description uh, at Blog Talk, at Talk Shoe. It'll I'll link all this. Um, but in one of the videos, a white person is talking to him, and he's upset. They're complaining about the non-white people being in Tel Aviv, in Israel, and the white person that's talking to David Sheen. He says, uh, you're just a tool of them, too. You know, you're just the left. You're just doing what they want you to do out here stirring up trouble. You're nothing to them but a Negro slave. That's what he calls David Sheen in the video. And I wanted to ask him uh, about that quote because I felt like that, right, that one little sentence tells you a lot about white supremacy. Um, this guy that, you know, uh, this white guy that's out in the streets mad because they got all these non-white people uh, in Israel uh, and he looks at David Sheen, who is out, he thinks, doing this work in help of non-white people and saying, you know, they're just using you. You're nothing to them but a Negro slave. And he says he is a white person. And a racist. Hmm. I've never heard a white person call another white person a Negro slave. That's different. They will. Whenever they figure that they can take a dig at you, and they know, especially if they probably knew this man was um, involved in a sexual relationship with black with a black person, and he felt he's going to hit below the belt, and that's probably why he called him those said those things to him. You know that the the system is so refined. I wonder if it's becoming so refined that it's confusing the racist. I, I mean, I, I, what I mean by that is these white people who are racist who want to be with black people to the extent of marrying them, um, are they so refined that they know that this is another way to promote confusion under the guise of fighting racism? Yes. Or are they just crazy? No. Yes. <laughs> they okay. know that this is going to be both. Right. It huh? might be both, but they are definitely refined enough to know that that sexual intercourse thing causes mass confusion and works to support their system. I definitely have concluded that. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I think, I'm sorry. 
I was just going to say me too, and I, I think if people go back and listen to the broadcast that happened today, you'll be able to pick up on that. You'll be able to pick up on that. He is keenly aware that, yeah, the black person next to him, confused. The black people probably he's speaking to, you know, didn't realize he was uh, having sex with a black person. You know, there's, there's confusion in that, um, and I think he, he's really aware of that. You know, what a great what setup, a great though. Setup, though. You, can be, you can be a racist. Be a racist. Practice racism. We got that echo. We got hey, that echo. Hey, Oh, I don't know. That's not me. Okay. I yeah, I just wanted to say, very refined. He's very refined. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I I agree. I was just going to add real quickly that it, it, it's, it's such a great setup for a white person. They can parade around as a non-racist white person, have sex with non-white white people to promote white supremacy, make money by giving speeches and conferences and whatever, making themselves be admired by the non-white people that they're victimizing, and still have so-called white privilege. I think if I was a white person and I wanted the best of both worlds, that's, that's how I would do it. Then why? Yeah, I mean, I could get paid for practicing racism and being admired by the people that I'm practicing it against. Because they're confused. Right, that's, that's a highly valued white person. White people really right. adore and admire people like that who wow. can come around black people you know, the black people don't care if they're racist or don't even know, uh, have sex with them, you know, confuse them, and still, like you said, be on the white team, no problem. Yeah, that's and get paid. A, a very, very valuable white person. Right, and get paid and just have carte blanche in both worlds where they can actually manipulate mm. and spy on the very people who think they're fighting, non-white people who think they're fighting with a non-racist white person and that non-racist white person playing both sides. And getting the benefits of both sides. I mean, I mean, it's amazing how many ways that white people so-called, I don't consider it a win in a moral sense. I consider it, however, a win if you're a very shallow person who doesn't really give a damn, you know, give a, doesn't care what you do. But there's a moral price to pay for it. You know, I don't really care uh, if it sounds spooky or whatever. But me personally, I worry about my karma. Yep. And uh, they may be getting away with something now. But that's going to be a heck of a karmic price to pay, and they're paying it right now. And you can see it in ways in which, uh, you know, if you really look at it, you can see that white people are paying a heavy karmic price. But I guess that shouldn't be our focus. I guess the real focus should be to get them off our backs and off our necks. You are, you're right about that because it, it, it's just, oh. <laughs> It is. It is. It to me. It, it's just. I just can't believe that this woman was standing up there. If my husband, it's like me standing in a room and hear my husband admitting on the phone that he's having an affair, and I'm standing right next to him, and I'm I'm cool with it, and I'm laughing about it. That's what it amounts to. She thinks he's brave. She probably admires him even more that he could be so honest. So he's probably scored points with her. Just coming on the radio and saying, I'm a racist, she probably thinks, well, he's not a real racist, but he's just such a good guy that he's acknowledging that he's even to blame for the stuff he's not doing. She probably admires him for this. Let's see, see if you could get him. When you email him, ask him if his wife can come on the show when he comes back. <laughs> That'd be real nice. Um, I think, I think, I think uh, part of the confusion is it's, it's really a result of uh, re, you know, the refined stage of racism. Mm-hmm. white supremacy, and that's, you know, w- w- white people have somehow uh, convinced and uh, the majority of non-white people to not equate uh, racism with a uh, crime or a racist with a criminal. So it's like, oh, yeah, I can, you know, I, I can be sitting next to this racist, but I'm, I'm, it's not, we don't see it as saying I'm sitting next to this criminal, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm helping this criminal, I'm aiding this criminal, I'm helping them out to feel better or whatever, you know. That's... Um, that's part of that refinement. See, this would be a first for the cows to have these people on the show and get a conversation because we've never had a white, non-white couple on the show where they could explain their relationship and the dynamics. So it would be very interesting if he would agree for him and his wife to come on and, you know, you and Justice, you know, even if, they don't, if they want to keep it a closed session just between you and Justice, that would be fine, but we could hear the dynamics between the two. I will ask. But uh, I will report. I mean, it's true. It's true. Um, Gus was asked, uh, or I guess let me let me rewind and give context for how all this came out in the first place. Um, 
when I spoke with Mr. Sheen via email, he went to check the show. I sent him two programs, uh, and then he went to look online, and he found my blog. And uh, he saw Tim Wise. He's like, oh, okay, you know, that's, you should have just said that from jump. You know, Tim Wise is great. And uh, then he continued to read, and he was like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, you got this thing on your blog about non-white people not having sex with white people. Wait a minute. <laughs> and uh, we had to have a, a conversation, and he was honest. He had said on the phone, he said, you know, I'm a racist. I'm white. I'm racist, of course. And we talked about Tim Wise, and then he said, so this sad thing about not having sex with white people. And, you know, I explained my position. I gave the whole the prisoner analogy, you know, that white people make rules against uh, having sexual intercourse where there's an unequal power dynamic. And he listened and he said, wow, that makes sense. It's it's very logical. And, you know, I understand what you're saying. And, yeah, it's it's accurate. It's logical. It, it makes it makes total sense. But uh, my wife is black and I don't want to talk about this on the program. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And so now I'm thinking like, oh, now I'm being asked to keep white people's secrets. Uh, and so I'm thinking, okay, so, you know, are you practicing racism in the relationship? Do you see, you know, this racism right there in, you know, the bedroom ostensibly, the kitchen or wherever else you all are? And he says, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, how could it not be there? And I'm like, wow, wow. And you don't want to talk about this on the program. He said, nope. Thought very interesting. I had quite a quite a moral dilemma um, about how to handle that, but I'm glad it came out on the program. Uh, I'm glad it came out on the program anyway. That was that was the hope that I had that it would come out and I wouldn't have to say anything, so I could keep my agreement and it would still come out. This is amazing. This is absolutely blows my mind. I wonder if she's from the U.S. or if she's she, she's got to be from somewhere in Africa, and if she's coming from a position of being disadvantaged coming over there where they're ill-treated in Israel, and I guess this white person looking upon her, then that in that case could be why she wouldn't have a problem with it. If, she, if she's from the United States and she's going to put up with this type of behavior, I have a question about her. Somebody coming off the continent, I could sympathize with them a little but not from the U.S. I think our confusion is so deep that, I mean, because I've seen this. I've seen it. I was at the... um I was at the White Privilege Conference. I, I don't recommend you. Ding, ding, like, ding, 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 ding. But, uh, you know, I was around all kinds of white people who were saying they were racist. I mean, red, it, matter of fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find a white person who didn't admit to being a racist. And, they, you know, the black people right there, they hear it. No biggie. You know, they're chucking up with them, sitting up close with them. And I tried to, you know, I was I was seeing the confusion in the non-white people, so I was trying to snap them out of it. So I would, you know, every night when I seen a group, especially it was young people there, too. So I would ask a white person, you know, it'd be one white person, a whole group of black people or non-white people, and I would have to ask them and say, hey, uh, you know, come here for a second. I thought, like, are you a racist? You know, you're a white person. Like, yeah, I'm a racist. And then she admit, yeah, I'm mistreating non-white people time to time. But it doesn't, it doesn't connect because the white person is still smiling and they're still being nice and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't. It's like, hey, this is a criminal. This person is, uh, you know, they, they're dedicated to keep this system going. And um, the conference going on right about now, it wasn't this the time when y'all went last year mm-hmm. in April, March, April? It's over now, but yeah, this, I think you it was already last had it week. Here? It was last week, um, I think, in Minnesota. Uh, I think there's somebody on the line calling from Minnesota, but yeah, it was uh, it was last week in, uh, I think, on the campus of the University of Minnesota uh, in Minneapolis. Um, Jacqueline Battalore was there. Um, I believe some other folks that have been guests on the program. I looked at the roster, and they had quite a few. Uh, they had quite a few. Um, quite a few speakers who used the term white supremacy in the title of their uh, report, which uh, which I thought was interesting. But yeah, I mean the confusion is going to be rife. I mean cowbells and and the whole nine. Uh, I did want to get in get in one thing uh quickly. There's seven minutes left in the program. This will be my uh 
my uh, final final comment for the program. Um, woo. <laughs> um, talk about confusion. Uh, Kree is typing. She was saying that uh, the confusion in people like the guest's wife is based on the definition of racism fashioned. Uh, oh, Mr. Sheen is typing. I think he might be listening. Uh, the confusion in people like the guest wife is based upon the definition of racism fashioned by a racist woman, racist man, as a feeling of superiority. Uh, it's not a truthful, accurate definition of abusive acts, uh, which I think is important. Uh, having having a more accurate understanding of what racism, white supremacy means, I think that would do a lot to uh, clear up some of the confusion uh, that we uh, are are suffering under. Uh, I thought Mr. Sheen was was ch- – oh, he did. He did share. He did share. He said, in point of fact, my wife is Canadian citizen born in Canada. So there you go. Um, that, hmm, that would be interesting. I would have questions around that too. But at any rate, um, the point I wanted to share about the confusion um, – I just watched Three the Hard Way. I'll have more to say about this. There'll be a program about this. Three the Hard Way with Jim Brown and the whole gang. Um, Fascinating film. Um, That film really is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of uh, older victims of racism. Uh, And just it really showed me how confused uh, non-white people are. Um, The quick the quick synopsis Three the Hard Way. A group of white people have decided that they're going to kill. Uh, all the black people in major cities in the United States by poisoning the water supply and doing so in a manner that it will only affect black people. And they reference sickle cell anemia in the film. Anyway, Jim Brown, these are the black males, three of them, they're supposed to stop this attack. Um, it takes about half of the film for our, our black heroes to figure out what's. it takes more than half the film for them to figure out what's going on, what the white people are trying to do. The interesting thing is that there's a scene where a white person tells them what's going to happen. He says, you all are done for. He tells them the cities, Detroit, L.A., D.C., they're going to get the water. The problem will be solved. You all are history. It's done. And you know what? It's only going to affect the niggers. The niggers are done for. He says this to them. And they're still sitting around scratching their head like, I don't know. What's going to happen? What are you? And I'm just looking like, are you serious? He just said the niggers. Gonna... At any rate. Uh, I say all that to say, I think Dr. Cambon touched on the confusion of non-white people. Sometimes we're so victimized, we do not want to acknowledge the truth. Like even when we have it like blatant in big crown written on the side of a blackboard in huge letters, like Timothy is a racist. And we still, we will run from that. Tr- like, no, 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 no. I, I just don't want to believe that. I don't want to, I just don't even think that could be possible to think that that could be true. Uh, in fact, Zach Casey said that precisely at the White Privilege Conference last year. He said it on this program that to acknowledge the truth that every white person is a racist and what that means, even the white person I'm in bed with, that is a bit that is a bit much truth for non-white people to handle, yep. and we run from that. I'll end right there, but that scene in Three the Hard Way, man, to have a white person sitting there telling you the niggers are going to get it. <laughs> They're going to get it. These are the cities you niggers are done for, and you still have the black people saying, man, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't understand. Woo. Mm, mm, mm. And I'll wrap there. We'll be back tomorrow. It's three minutes left in the broadcast. I just have two words to throw in. Stockholm Syndrome, if you don't know what it is. Look it up. Look it up. (laughs) Post-traumatic stress slavery syndrome. Look it up. If you put the two together, you have a lot of the answers for why black people act the way they act. Is They are benefactors. They are the ones to provide everything we need. They intimidate us. We got to be real with that. That's why black people can be in the midst of white people and listen to them say they're racist. What are you going to do about it? The black person, no, they can't do nothing about it, so you might as well grin and bear it. Cognitive dissonance. That's another symptom. Because, I remember that movie. I think uh, why, 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 Fred Hammer Williamson was, the, um, along with Jim Brown, was in it. <laughs> 